Preface of a Treaty of Modern Falconry. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. A Treaty of Modern Falconry, to which is prefixed from authors not generally known, an introduction showing the practice of falconry in certain remote times and countries, by James Campbell. Preface. As every nation has a peculiarity of manners which makes it different from its neighbors, so every age has some predominant qualities which distinguish it from those that went before and from those that come after it. The age of Leo X is celebrated for the resurrection and rapid progress of the fine arts and of polite literature. That of Cromwell is remembered with execration as the triumph of tyranny, enthusiasm, and hypocrisy. The characteristic of each age, however, is more clearly seen by posterity, who view it at the proper distance than by contemporaries who stand too close to it to observe it with exactness. This last being my own situation with regard to the present times, it is with hesitation I venture to place the spirit of them in a perfect energy of ridicule, skepticism, and incredulity, which delights in opposing almost everything whatever. Men derive an extraordinary sort of pleasure from contradiction, which, thank heaven, the peculiar structure of my passions cannot relish. They measure the worth of every object and opinion by the fickle standard of their tastes, humors, and prejudices, loudly condemning this moment the very things which but the moment before they embraced with raptures. Now they think it clever to turn whatever is respectable into a jest, whatever is probable into doubt, whatever is demonstrable into absurdity. But were the world to give a general assent to their positions, they would straight stand forth as the redoubtable champions of common sense. Whether pride decoys them into this study of singularity, whether they are conscious of perfections which deserve the admiration of the crowd and ought not be obscured in it, this is an inquiry which demands greater acuteness than I am possessed of. I wish I may not be mistaken when I take upon me the suspect that they are the practical disciples of that laudable philosophy which surprises us with the discovery that beauty and deformity, virtue and vice, are not in the objects to which they ascribe these qualities, but only in the feelings of those who contemplate them. Thus the charms of a fine lady are not in herself, but in the inward emotions of her admirers. The integrity of a worthy man is not to be found in himself, but in the favorable sentiments of his neighbors. And my book must not, according to this humiliating system, pretend to any more merit than the generosity of my readers will be pleased to confer upon it. This amazing philosophy convinces me that popularity is the great end to which all men ought to direct their attentions, since without it they must all be fools or knaves or profligates, and the ladies let them see to it. Unless they learn to be a little more explicit and kind with regard to their fond languishers, must be all transformed into frights and witches. The man must have more than the patience of ten Joves, whose eternal feeling shall preserve to paint his mistress as an angel, after he is exhausted of the kind of wretch, her whole stock of torment, and made him more miserable than a score of devils. The reader will take notice that I do not speak of my own experience. The sex have always used me with a warmth which I shall never forget, but ah, which I shall never again be able, however willing, to deserve. If I have properly described the spirit of the times, I have little cause to hope that the work I am now offering to the public will procure me many compliments, since it is introduced with a few narrations which are not yet according to the common notions of mankind. My readers will easily discover the narrations I have in my eye, and I will not be so much their enemy as to deprive them of this delicious exertion of their sagacity by pointing out these exceptionable parts of the book myself. I am not prophetic enough to foretell the treatment they shall think due to my labors, but I hope it will not be to the severest kind, after they are acquainted with the motives which seduced me into the perilous character of an author. These, in a word, were to entertain them with a view of falconry in times and countries very different from their own, to help them to some insight into this manly art, as it is practiced in modern days, if they do not already understand it, and to leave a remembrance behind me, which may now and then tell future sportsmen that I have lived not altogether useless to their interests. 
Such are the motives from which I have written, and if I may be allowed to judge of their nature, they are far from being provocatives to overwhelm me with a derision or contempt of any reasonable person whatever. Nay, I will be bold to say more. These motives will be truly learned and judicious, be an apology for the numerous oversights which their perscapacity will detect in my performance, but which their sweetness of temper will conceal from those who succeed best in criticism at second hand. Experience has taught me that those who are best qualified to judge are evermore the least forward to condemn, and when necessity exhorts their disapprobation, the readiest to soften the rigor of their sentence by every comfort their humanity can suggest. Give me the countenance of a few men of this magnanimous character, and I shall easily endure the strictures of those who are actuated by the odd spirit of the times. Yet I must be aware of exasperating men, of their immense talents. I am a person myself of the most harmless and innocent disposition in the world, and most seriously inclined to live to the end of my days, without the smallest intercourse with them, and therefore they will lay me under their strongest obligation of gratitude if they suffer me to walk on to fame, without the honor of their notice, pox on it, do they imagine that an author can find any amusement in their effusions of scorn, petulance, and acrimony, when they are directed against the best efforts of his mental powers? But why should I hope to escape persecution? This is a piece of good fortune which writers have not attained, who have handled subjects of very high importance, and with a reach of genius that commands my admiration and respect. The last, so far as I know, who has been attacked by the spirit of the times, is a gentleman who, ambitious of literary fame, and nobly qualified to earn it, has published a treaty on the origin and progress of language, the beginning and pledge of a work which will do honor to the intellectual faculties. In this profound but perscapitious, masculine but elegant book, the author has displayed the most accurate knowledge of the operations of the human understanding. According to the conceptions of both the ancient and latter philosophers, he remarks with great justness and difficult rise and tardy growth of our ideas and applies his ingenious observations on that subject by a beautiful analogy to show that language is not natural to mankind. That is, language is not, as emotion or sleeping, the effect of any peculiar instinct, but acquired by experience, imitation, or instruction. This proposition which no mortal ever did or ever will deny he illustrates at great length by examples taken from the very lowest and rudest stage of language and thence ascending through some of the intermediate stages to that which is generally allowed to be the most eloquent and polished though he labors to establish a point which never can be overturned yet he has rendered his work both useful and entertaining by his detection of modern errors and by the view which his uncommon knowledge of the Greek tongue has enabled him to present of ancient truths. Further, as his reasonings are conducted with a coolness and precision which is not usually met with, he is one of the few authors whom every man ought to study, who would learn to think with coherence, and to unfold his arguments with persuasive force and clearness. He seems to have been born to make the vanity of the philosophers of our days to shrink, by showing them that the most valuable of the logical and metaphysical notions on which many of them build their fame were as well known and more elegantly explained by the ancients. In a word, this author has an indisputable title to the character of a genuine philosopher. If depth of reflection, novelty of investigation, and strength of argument can confer it, and therefore the spirit of the times has become his enemy, this gentleman had, no doubt, the most refined and delicate enjoyment in perceiving his ideas rise, formally in his mind, with ease and connection, and materially throwing themselves, as they rose, into the most natural and significant expressions. His pleasure would receive a vast addition of liveliness when his imagination afterwards anticipated the praises which an improving world would lavish on his labors. So new, so surprising, so admirable. This is an agreeable delusion to which we authors readily surrender ourselves, admits the successful glow of composition, and, though our infirmity, it is absolutely necessary to support us under the wasting fatigue of study, 
and to push us on to the completion of our tasks. But which, by the hope of glory, we fancy that mankind, as soon as our works are announced to them, are to fling away their ordinary occupations, to run in all the eagerness of curiosity to our booksellers for copies of the wonderful performance, to burst out at every bright sentiment into our applauses, and to talk long, long afterwards of nothing but our prodigious merit. Alas, amidst the fervors of our vanity, we quite lose sight of the spirit of the times. But it soon starts up before our terrified imaginations, and convinces us from the little accession of respect we derive from our lucubrations, that we only dreamed ourselves into importance. Nothing surely can give deeper and more agonizing wounds to the self-love of an author who has denied himself the ordinary amusements of life in order to provide edification and delight to the public than to find that the glorious efforts of his taste, wit, and ingenuity are known only to himself and his bookseller, or, if known to a few more, are treated with neglect, contempt, or derision. This usage, which is famously common, is so provoking that, were my counsels of weight in the republic of letters equal to their wisdom, I would soon persuade all ingenious men to confine the illuminating beams of knowledge to their own breasts, and permit the shades of ignorance and barbarity to deepen over an ungrateful world. I am sure the great philosophers to whom I have paid that tribute of applause, which is justly due to his extraordinary merit, will readily enter into and heartily go along with this necessary measure, if his resentment bear any proportion to his wrongs. Perhaps all his friends have hitherto been too tender of the peace of his mind, to communicate to him the insulting opinions of his countrymen relative to his excellent treaty. And indeed I am miserable that I am among the first to assure him they are very far from thinking it as conducive to either their recreation or instruction as he thinks it himself. They ask it one another, not in modest whispers, but in the plainest and most audible articulation, what spirit possessed him to misapply so much science and erudition in order to trace human nature, the object of so many celestial favors, back to a state little superior to that of the brutes. Then they are snarely inquisitive to know what particular blessings does he mean to confer on his fellow creatures by such a fine metaphysical discovery. Whether has it tended to give more strength to his own principles of religion and morality, or will it produce so noble an effect on theirs? But they are all vehemently agitated by the spirit of the times. When he tells them, they may be so accustomed to the water as to grow as perfectly amphibious as seals or otters, that men must have been many ages in the state of the beaver before they invented a language. That men, in their natural state, differ from the brutes only by their unexerted capacities, being totally destitute of ideas, laws, and religion. That there is no associating principle in the human breast, but the fear of hunger, cold, and wild beasts not to mention many other pleasant novelties of the same marvelous kind. My philosophy, which dares not venture beyond the art and practice of hawking, qualifies me not to judge of these sublime speculations, but it enables me to conclude that the learned and sagacious author, who has bestowed much study and inquiry for several years on such interesting paradoxes, deserves more credit in asserting them than any other man deserves in denying them who never bestowed any study or inquiry on them at all. These surprising discoveries flow most assuredly from his general system, and men would act more wisely and more suitably to their present state of improvement if, instead of controverting and ridiculing them, they tried to find out the advantages wrapped up in them from vulgar fight. First, is it possible to render mankind amphibious? In this case, the art of amphibiousness would be an important enlargement of the circle of modern education, as it would add to the sports of gentlemen that of hunting all sorts of fishes, and enable the poor to walk the bottom of the ocean in search of those treasures which have lain there from time immemorial, and are daily increasing. Secondly, have men lived speechless, that is, without sound significant, for many ages in the state of the beaver? Why, to be sure, the Jewish legislator must in this case have been mistaken in the account. 
he has left us in the origin of human society and if so i fancy the wisest thing we can do is to get rid of our christianity as fast as we can and embrace the charming and indulgent the easy and polite doctrines which are so elegantly taught by the zealous and philosophical apostles of the free thinkers thirdly are men in their natural state totally destitute of ideas laws and religion on this supposition all those people must be considered notwithstanding their articulation as still in a state of nature whose minds are found empty or nearly empty of these matters this very simple observation points out the expediency and indeed the necessity of apprehending and putting such full-grown savages under the tuition of able masters who may carry their capacities through habits and faculties into energies for the intercourse of political society i hope the author will not be angry with me for imagining that he is the properest person in the world to conduct an academy of this nature both because he perfectly understands the dispositions of wild men and because in the course of his superintendency he would make many curious remarks on them which would render his intended history of man immensely diverting lastly does a human heart acknowledge no other principle of association than the fear of danger this granted we are happily freed from the kindly stirrings of benevolence and need give ourselves no trouble about performing the teasing and expensive duties of generosity and friendship mercy and candor towards our neighbors except when our own interests or conveniency engages us in them these are a few of the profitable consequences that follow from the author's discoveries and of the benefit of these people bereave themselves from their subjection to the spirit of the times i do verily believe that by far the greater part of the human race are upon one account or other fit subjects for that academy at the head of which our author might be placed with great propriety the reader will permit me to inform him that i am apt to fancy myself grown acquainted with any person of whom i write long and the author i hope will pardon me in compliance with this foresaid humor i address myself directly to him as to a friend whom i have just acquired and for whom i profess the most perfect energy and esteem you tell us sir with an air of belief which i think sincere of men who ate fish four days without drinking till the fifth of men who lived on the best terms with seals without drinking at all of men whose food was fruit and twigs whereby they became as light as feathers of men who consider their own vermin as very tolerable diet and make a meal on them now and then and of men whose rumps are embellished with fine long tapering tails like those of cats you will hardly believe what i am going to tell you but it is a certain fact that these and the like blessed stories which you produce from authors of unquestioned truth and acute observation have made some people suspect you to be a sly arch wag who wants to set simple men agaping and staring that you may have the pleasure of laughing at their silly confusion for my own part i am as thoroughly persuaded of the truth of your stories as you are of yourself i cannot but wonder they meet with any opposition in a generation wherein it is not unfashionable to believe the non-existence of both mind and body but my wonder ceases now that i recollect the contradictory spirit of the times your story of the men equipped with tails is to me a full confirmation of all the rest which are sprinkled throughout your valuable treaty and my ready assent to their real existence was originally produced by a precious book written by a frenchman and his nation you know is not a bit given to fitting afterwards established by the fight which i had of one of these people myself as you have not quoted this singular writer who proves with the greatest clearness that all things on earth animals as well as vegetables were in the beginning produced in the sea i cannot forbear thinking he is one of the few authors with whom you are acquainted his sixth day of creation wherein he treats of the origin of man and of other animals contains so many instances of men with tails that had you read him you certainly would have strengthened coping's authority for this fact with his he tells us that these people are fierce in their dispositions 
not overburdened with good sense, and of great bodily strength. There are, he says, a great many of them in Ethiopia, Egypt, the Indies, England, and France, but especially in Scotland. As to those in France, he declares he saw several of them himself. At Tripoli he saw a black with a tail six inches long, who, with two oars, rode a large flock with greater swiftness than twenty ordinary men could have done. This man was covered all over with hair, and Borneo was his native country, where most of the men and women have their accomplishment of tails. He tells us of a French officer who had this appendage six inches long, too, and was all over his body as rough and shaggy as a bear. And this account he received from an Italian courtesan who spoke of his countrymen in a style that showed she did not dislike him as a lover. He adds that in the island of Formosa, as well as in the Maluka and Philippine Islands, there are whole nations garnished with tails, and where consequently it would be monstrous to see people without any. To this French gentleman's stories, let me join the opinion of some of the Jewish writers who inform us that Adam himself was produced with a tail. But those who have a mind to know into what this primitive tale was afterwards transformed will receive ample satisfaction from Bale's dictionary. I am afflicted beyond measure that to these unquestioned authorities I am not able to add that of the chaste and immaculate, the simple and ingenious Mr. Abad, who was versed to a miracle in matters of this kind, the man who saw eight and twenty Britons eaten at a breakfast by a tribe of Indians, must certainly have seen nations with tails, and with large tails, too. And, sir, if he did not communicate this curious antidote to you in conversation, his silence must be imputed to his fear of bringing his other stories into doubt by retailing one which, at first sight, would justify a little skepticism among people of narrow and prejudiced minds. Perhaps he was also concerned for the honor of his order, which such a seemingly bouncing narrative from a member of it might furnish. For it is well known to the articulating part of mankind that the Jesuits in general are the declared enemies of trick, cunning, and deceit, of evasion, prevarication, and probabilism, of intrigue, politics, and cabaling. But I hope the Reverend Father Abad will not permit his delicate regard to the veracity to rob the world of the numberless astonishing observations and discoveries which he has made in the course of his travels. And, for his encouragement, I ensure him on both your part and mine that his stories must be wonderful indeed if they surpass our vast energies of belief. What I have said hitherto on this deserting subject rests wholly on the veracity of other people, but what I am going to advance further rests wholly on my own. I saw one of these tailed men with my own eyes, who was a sturdy, alert fellow, and indeed, sir, he was the owner of a signal tail, a tail, sir, of honorable dimensions, a tail that showed he was endowed with strong parts and qualified to fill the greatest places. As he spoke only the inarticulate language, which nobody about him understood, I cannot gratify your curiosity with the detail of his parentage, education, or adventures from his own mouth, which to you would be extremely entertaining, as it would be to myself, because it would be extremely singular. Nicobar, I suppose, gave birth to this hapless foreigner, and saw his earlier years gliding away in careless gaiety, under the soft indulgence of his parents, who beheld with joy his gay and lively genius daily expanding and advancing to its full vigor. They would thence prognosticate exquisite felicity to their dear boy, and that he might enjoy his future fortunes with dignity, they sent him to Borneo to polish his manners, and learn the knowledge of the world by traveling. Their parting with her darling would be a scene of the most affecting tenderness. Perhaps she was the stay and last hope of their family. They would dread the violence of the tempest, the unwholesomeness of sea provision, the change of his native air, and, ah, they would supplicate him to beware of righteous living of meddling with the prejudices of strangers, and of making too ostentatious a display of his tail, which might cause his good sense to be called in question. They would embrace him with hearts filled with anxiety, 
and eyes streaming with tears, and tails dangling sorrowfully down in the dust. Perhaps the youth himself beheld the anguish with, with some yearnings of feline love, but these emotions would soon yield to the joy of seeing himself at his own disposal, with plenty of money in his pocket, and on his way to a land overflowing with everything capable of pleasing his senses and charming his imagination. At length he landed in Borneo, merrily wagging his tail on seeing himself again on firm ground, and impetuous to plunge into all the dissipations of this voluptuous country. How long he continued in that delicious course of sensuality on which he now entered, or for what misdemeanor he was afterwards banished from it. These, sir, are parts of this young man's history, on which I dare not pretend to have any certain knowledge. Perhaps he had fought a duel, or cheated at play, or had derided the superstitions of the natives, or had plotted against the government, or had tried to bilk his creditors, or had aspersed the character of a, the prime minister. I say perhaps, for I would not positively aver he was punished for any of these crimes, as I have no sort of evidence to prove such a heavy charge. Nay, as I never saw myself, or heard from others, that the poor lad had the least propensity to any of these atrocities, I cannot imagine they were the source of his misfortunes. But as he always manifested a languishment of temper, which seemed to incline to gallantry, I suspect that his exile originated from some indiscreet affair of the heart. Be this as it will, it is certain he was delivered into the hands of some British sailors for transportation, who landed him safe in a lay, and presented him as a curiosity to a gentleman there, in the corner of whose kitchen chimney I saw him chained to a great wooden block, which served him for a stool as well as a stake. I own, sir, it raised a secret indignation in my breast to see such a noble, clever, lively stripling treated with so much contumely for a transgression which is every day committed and every day forgiven in the most polite and enlightened nations on this side of the globe. Ah, how it would have stabbed his indulgent parents to the heart to have seen the young gentleman compared to mingle with menial servants and involved in dismal clouds of peat reek, which conspired with his woes to exhaust the moisture of his eyes. The fortitude with which he bore his sufferings was altogether heroic. He disdained all intercourse with men, and wretched out of their hands the sticks they lifted up against him, with a force and agility that showed nothing wanting to him but freedom, to convince them of his ability to do himself justice. But his cares to the woman was not roughened into aversion by all the disasters they had occasioned him. To them he behaved with all his natural politeness, particularly to the kitchen maid, for whom he had conceived the warmest and most direct passion. Alas, he felt his heart faster entangled in the charms of Kate than his body in the iron chain which surrounded it. In vain his parents now visit the coast to descry the ship which is to bring their darling to their arms. In vain his former mistress hopes to press the accomplished youth to her heaving bosom. In vain the monarch of Nicobar expects to place him in his council and number him among the brightest lustres of his court. The chain and Kate, more attractive than the chain, detain him from the ardent wishes and sink his fame and fortune in the thickest shades of obscurity. Sir, is this plain narration, consisting partly of fact and partly of conjecture, do not convince the spirit of the times of the actual existence of creatures with tails, which are indeed real men and women, the following method to which I advise you in a friendly way, is the only expedient whereby you can vanquish the reigning ridicule, skepticism, and incredulity. You need only to procure an infant from Nicobar, and as the humanity of the orangutans is also brought into doubt, you may at the same time get one of their infants from Angola. You may easily obtain the latter from an East Indian captain, and the former from any worthy gentleman who are concerned in the slave trade. If you can instruct these children in languages, arts, and sciences, you will thoroughly confirm your speculations, force conviction into the spirit of the times, and, and spread your fame from the rising to the setting of the sun. The young men might be sent home after their education, where they would teach their countrymen to form ideas, to make abstractions, and to bend their tongues to articulation, greatly to the improvement of natural knowledge and the extension of the British commerce.
We original, or rather eccentric authors, labor under numberless difficulties, from our superiority or opposition to by far the greater part of mankind, by which we excite their envy or resentment. The novelty of your theories and illustrations strikes them at first with surprise, but that emotion soon yields to a concern for their own familiar and riveted prejudices, which they now think endangered. What they themselves never saw or heard before, they fancy could not have been seen, and ought not be reported now, and so they grow angry at us for kindly endeavouring to widen the compass of their knowledge. Thus it falls out that you have, and I shall probably have, so many adversaries, but I am prepared for my sufferings, by the view of those which you actually undergo. I wish I had your philosophy to enable me to endure mine with that meek and gentle dignity, with which, I suppose, it enables you to endure yours. We shall preserve, however, to bring into the rank of truce those things which the ignorant have hitherto placed among fables, regardless of such persons as judge of the fate of the whole world by the little spot wherein they were born. Writers of our uncommon character must rest satisfied with the approbation of men of large minds, and as you, sir, are endowed with a very large mind, I cheerfully dedicate the following introduction to you, which you will perceive to be pretty much in the spirit of your own book. May I hope that you will deign to accept of this my sincere respect and esteem. I rejoice in the support which my stories receive from yours, and in that too which I flatter myself, yours receive from mine, and hope we shall evermore fight reciprocally for the wonders of each other. Meanwhile, I beg leave to assure the public that we have not written in concert. I did not suggest a single hint to your treaty, nor did you furnish a single tale to my introduction. End of preface. Part 1 of Introduction of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Introduction. Hunting, fishing, and hawking are diversions which join profit to amusement. On the former account, they were anciently the serious business of all ranks, and on the latter are now followed by the great and opulent. Mankind were unacquainted in the more early period of society with the earliest arts of living which accident or ingenuity has since brought to light. The spontaneous fruits of the earth afforded them but a lean and scanty subsistence. They were, therefore, obliged to prey on the wild inhabitants of the forest, the flood, and the air. These animals were, many of them, superior to mankind in strength, all of them in agility, and so men could not master them by their bodily powers. In order, then, to get them into their hands, they sought the aids of contrivance and stratagem. They observed that the same creatures which they wanted to feed on were food to other creatures, qualified by nature to seize them. Thus they saw the hare run down by the hound, the same and dragged out of the pool by the otter, and the partridge borne away by the hawk. Human invention, sharpened by necessity, is wonderfully rich in resources. Men, seeing with what facility these creatures subdued their prey, would soon perceive the advantage of being connected with them. Hence they would form the design of taming them to their service. As the fields produce more animal food than either the water or the air, the dog would be the first object of their flattering regards. Those who lived on the banks of the river would court the otter to their familiarity and make him contribute to their maintenance also. These essays would give origin to hunting and fishing, sports which the skill and industry of succeeding ages have carried to their perfection. These sports fall not within my design, and therefore I leave them with just observing that they were probably known before falconry. The reason is obvious. The fields and the streams were more acceptable than the heights of the air, and dogs and otters are at first much more tractable than hawks. Those methods of procuring food which appeared easiest would for that reason be preferred by a starving generation to those that seem next to impossible. It is from the amusements of children I am going to deduce the rise of the noble science of falconry. They who know the esteem 
I have for this science will acquit me of having any design to lessen his dignity by such an origin. If people trace back the most useful arts of life, they will discover few of them which we do not owe their existence to chance. Whoever has examined the first appearance of a hawk must confess that it does not look as if it were capable of culture. Its eye is sharp and ferocious, its motions are quick and impatient, and it furiously attacks and ravishly feeds on its prey. Men would therefore regard the hawk as irreclaimable, and think as little of employing it to procure game for them as of the wolf to provide them in venison. What seemed impossible to ripen reflection was shown to be practicable by the diversions of children. Everybody knows how remarkably fond they are of young birds, and how tenderly they bring them up. They also display much ingenuity in wearing off the natural wildness of the, and in habituating them to understand their signals and obey their voices. Parents observing this innocent propensity of their children would gladly take every opportunity of gratifying it, and their way of life would give them many. The chase to which they were attached by necessity would sometimes lead them among the cliffs of high rocks, where hawks are wont to place their ears. When they lighted on those with eyes, their parental affection would prompt them to carry home the young birds to their children. Taught themselves by observation that hawks fed on flesh, they would direct their children to bring up the eyes with animal food. Young hawks, now being continually among the hands and accustomed to the voices of children, would soon forget their natural wildness and contract an affection for those who bred them. They would fly from their hands, so around them in the air, and return to them. On these occasions it would divert the children exceedingly to observe the consternation into which their birds cast all the winged tribes and with what boldness they pursued and attacked their prey. Children are naturally generous and communicative, almost incapable of enjoying pleasure without a crowd. Actuated by this disposition, they would invite their parents to partake of the happiness themselves drew from the flights of their hawks. Imagine how great must have been the amazement of these simple people when they saw, for the first time, birds which ever before they had thought irreclaimable, managed by their children. It would look like a prodigy to see them mounting to the skies from the hands which fed them, and returning immediately at the sound of the voices which caressed them. Men would still be more astonished to observe them so very tame as even to part with their prey to their keepers, and fly afterwards in quest of more with their former spirit. Astonishment would give way to reflection. The more sagacious would perceive that by the hawk they might command the sky, and thence open a new source of provisions. The experiment was worth the making, and those who first conceived the idea of it with no doubt go directly about it. Expose them to ridicule and bring the fondness of their understandings in question. Among that set of mortals, who to the dullness gifted them by nature, have made a proper addition of self-conceit. The success of the first essays would soon put to silence, such as the laughter as were not incorrigible and encouraged their perseverance. The hawk now shared their affection with the hound, and the training of it became a capital object of their attention. They studied its temper, sought the best ways of preserving its health, and investigated remedies to cure its diseases. They imparted their observations to their children, who handed them to theirs, augmented by their own. And thus falconry grew out of experience of successive generations into the regular system into which we now see it. The science brought within the power of men every bird productive of food or diversion, and the air which had been so long to them a barren desert became a fund of luxury and recreation. Hawking is one of those amusements which is suitable to the majesty of kings and to the grandeur of nobility and higher gentry. It is easy to account for the air of dignity which now attends it. The experience of one age transmitted to another enlarged and polished the human mind, and men took hold of and improved every incident which tended to render life more easy and comfortable. 
As they proceeded in the culture of their intellectual powers, arts and trades were invented, and these in their turn promoted the advancement of civilization. Mankind accordingly withdrew some of themselves, gradually from their origin, but precarious way of living by hunting and engaged in pursuits which at once softened their tempers and procured them a certain livelihood. Hawking and the other sports of the field were indeed productive of much diversion, but did not always def defend them from the attacks of hunger, and therefore were glad to exchange them for occupations which never put them to fruitless toil. Falconry now ceasing to be regarded by the lower ranks of men as necessary for the support of life, fell entirely into the hands of persons of birth, fortune, and leisure. Kings and princes, nobles and gentlemen, pursued the sport of the sky, while their inferiors made carts, followed the plow, or bred cattle. Nothing could be more fortunate to society than this revolution, which was the cause of the gentility and greatness that are now ascribed to hogging. It delivered this art of promoting strength and agility by the allurements of pastime from plebeian use and reflected on it the honor and magnificence of the illustrious personages who were devoted to it. Monarchs now took the hawk under their protection and senates enacted laws for the preservation of its life. The same hands which swayed the scepters of nations and stretched forth commanding truncheons of victorious hosts did not disdain the weight of the keen-eyed bird. Sage lawgivers viewed it with admiration and thought their wisdom properly employed in securing it from the folly and violence of men. The muse of charing scoff so what edifices were reared from its reception and officers with honorable salaries were appointed to take care of its welfare and train it up for its functions. Falconsworth, the city where it still triumphs, demonstrates the honor wherein it is still held by all the princesses of Europe, who maintain falconers there to provide the finest birds. The manly pleasures which flow from its spirit, rapidly and tractableness, made it worthy of and rewarded all the attention of which it was the object. When it pursues its prey to the clouds, it draws up the eyes of all men after it, and fills their souls with the most agreeable fits of surprise. So exquisite is the delight it then bestows that it robs the sovereign of the obsequious regards of their soothing courtiers, and confounds the lords of the earth with the amazing and wonderful crowd which surrounds them. When we compare the state of falconry in our own days, with what it was in ancient times, we must acknowledge and lament its sad decay in the world. It is not difficult, and it may be worthwhile, to point out this deplorable revolution of sporting and its causes. It was when hounds and hawks were the only means whereby the recreations of the field could be enjoyed with dignity that the reputation of falconry was highest. It was then studied and practiced by men of rank and distinction in every country of Europe where anything of civilization existed. Game was to be found everywhere in the greatest plenty, without the interposition of the legislator for its preservation, hawks being adapted to give much sport without much slaughter. But firearms were at length invented, and this invention introduced as remarkable an alteration in the sporting as it did into the art of war. The sportsman had hitherto drawn his pleasure from observing the various surprising turns of the chase or flight, and when he obtained it, he was little mortified that the hare of woodcock made its escape at last from his hounds or hawk. This is the true idea of the pleasure which the sports of the field are qualified to afford. But this idea was gradually lost after guns were made of easy carriage and pointers trained to find out game. Sport came now to be confined entirely to the act of putting the game to death, and a man measured the liveliness of his diversion according to the number of animals he had slain. But still no birds were yet killed which kept in cover, 
and therefore the game continued to be plentiful enough for every kind of fporting. This new idea, however, of fport made hawking decline, because a good marksman could produce more of this bloody sport of amusement from his gun than from a hawk. It also helped very much to bring the latter into disuse, that the former could be kept with less expense and without any trouble. Though the pointer and the gun were of considerable detriment to hawking at their first introduction, yet they did not triumph over this diversion, till the dexterity of the French lighted on the knack of shooting on wing, and taught it to their neighbors. This knack enabled every man to act up to his idea of sporting, by the ease and certainty with which it enabled him to kill game, and thus it reached the blow to falconry which has proved almost fatal to it. A man of sure eye may now kill or wound, in a few days, all the fowls of an extensive moor, and, by this means, the gun has not only hurt falconry, but also gone near to exterminate the game altogether. Hawking is at present confined to a few noblemen and gentlemen, who, with their spirit of the, their great ancestors, inherit their masculine taste for the sorts of the field likewise. The almost universal attachment of sportsmen to the pointer and gun shows their degeneracy from the elevated amusements of their predecessors, in a light, a light which I never opened my eyes to, without all the anguish of the bitterest regret. Could a falconer, who lived two or three centuries ago, ah, that flourishing period of the princely sport, burst forth the chains of death, and get for a few days into the world, how it would grieve his manly heart to observe the neglect into which the hawk has fallen. He would survey the scenes of his former joys, and with such tears as spirits shed, mourn long over the melancholy stillness which reign over those hills and dales which his own voice used to awaken into life and exultation. His sorrow would receive new pugnancy when he perceived how scarce his brethren are in society, how obsolete their language and how wings are grown, and that a price is set on the head of the hawk, as if this generous bird had been guilty of the most atrocious crimes. The manifest inferiority of our age to his in sport would fill his soul with indignation. He would fly from the hated fight to his residence in the other world, and carry tidings to the band of departed falconers, which would communicate to them the angry emotions of his own breast. These reflections call up before me the majesty and honor of ancient times, when every warlike baron prepared his hardy limbs for the toils of battle by the heavenly recreation, and make me bewail my severe destiny, which has thrown me forward into a generation which it is dangerous to paint in its true colors. Every turreted castle rears itself to my fancy, surrounded with hawks, perching on their blocks in stately order, or echoing from its vaults, responsive to the adjacent rocks and lakes, with the cheering voices of their keepers, who direct their circling flights. Now Falconer's voice, loud, full, and tremulous, ushering into the morn, strikes mine ear, which, from the morn till the shades of evening deepen into night, animates the silent loneliness of the forest, vales and mountains with tones of manly gladness the numerous game yet undiminished by the gun's murderous violence obscures the face of heaven with multitude and offers to the wondering eyes of the spectators all the varieties of sport to be derived from aerial chase and conflict in this glorious period indolence and disease were not collected at expense from every corner of the world and luxury was a vice which did not vex the holy meekness of our priests, nor exacerbate the keen indignation of our satirists. The stimulating seductions of the table prolonged not by the feast beyond nature's call, nor did the down and gorgeous furniture of the bed force voluptuous slumbers after the sun had proclaimed the day. The plain and copious meal, by hunger seasoned, 
and fleep profound as death by weariness brought on flushed with ruddy health the looks of nobles and gentles gave a spring and firmness to their steps and swelled their souls with courage and resolution which laughed at danger they saw it as they sported when their country's wrongs demanded their sword with keenness and alacrity and preluded to the field of battle while they attended the flights of their hawks these were the times when a man inspired with the sublime enthusiasm of falconry would wish to have lived those who are at present addicted to the pointer and gun are not however altogether inexcusable though those who first forsook the hawk can claim no sort of apology the former are come into the world when fowling is the prevailing diversion and so they along with the fashion without once considering whether there be any diversion more worthy of their pursuit to take a sure aim is celebrated as the grand accomplishment of a sportsman and the number of fowls he kills in a day is always rehearsed to his praise accordingly a young gentleman who hears such discourses studies the direction of his eye as soon as he is able to manage a gun and pants for this sort of bloody dexterity he is extremely mortified when he returns unsuccessful from the field and received by his acquaintance with sarcasm and laughter but when his hand and eye have done their duty he produces the feathered spoils of the air with smiling triumph and is treated with respect by those around him thus his taste for sporting is so early corrupted that it can hardly ever be reformed afterwards and he becomes a depraver of others in his turn might i obtain leave to name epicures and poachers in the same page with sportsmen i would say the present plan of the recreations of the field seems calculated only for those people the nice epicure who picks felicity from the bones of fat partridges poults and woodcocks is deeply interested in the death of these fowls and prompted by his liquorish palate to kill as many of them as he can the wandering poacher adopts the same conduct from another motive that of drawing bread and brandy from sauntering in idleness the voluptuous epicure therefore and the worthless poacher are furnished with reasons to justify their love of shooting on wing perfectly suitable to their respective characters but by no means to that of a genuine sportsman who professes to seek pleasure not death from his amusements there are two consequences of the gun which i would humbly recommend to the notice of gentlemen first this engine sets the vulgar on a level with them in point of the sports of the field and secondly it threatens the utter destruction of the game here objects are at stake and ready to be annihilated and of no less importance than the rank of our gentry and the very existence of their pastimes this is as true as it is alarming and calls for an immediate remedy first with regard to the elevation of the vulgar to the rank of gentlemen let the following observation meet with the attention they deserve all men come into the world in nearly the same state of weakness and stupidity place an infant prince among a score of infant beggars the former without ornaments and the latter without rags where is the man who could separate his highness from the lousy rogues at first sight it is not the make of the body therefore nor the structure of the mind which distinguishes the higher from the lower ranks of mankind nature is equally beneficent to both gentlemen and peasants in these respects and these are as capable of those of the polish of education and company what then are the discriminating circumstances between them why a line of ancestors remarkable for public and private virtue opulent possessions originally conferred by the sovereign in approbation of high merit and a conduct regulated by the laws of bravery generosity politeness and justice these are the foundations of true gentility and always bestow it whatever the man's birth is in whom they center gentility is displayed to the world sometimes by an easy propriety and sometimes by a dazzling magnificence of lodging table dress 
retinue, and amufement, beyond the reach of people in the lower ftations of life, but beheld by them with deference and refpeft. Now, could all men rife to the splendors of gentility, the real gentleman would fee his dignity loft in the crowd, and himfelf without notice, unlefs his fuperior talents and virtues could command it. Whatever diverfion, therefore, he purfues, in which the vulgar can fhare with him independently of his permiffion, diminishes from the fubmiffive. Regards they owe to his character and situation in life. Accordingly, it is observable that a man of rank is treated with a freedom that approaches to familiarity in the field by the same persons who appear before him with the most bashful awkwardness in his drawing room. This difference of behavior in different places is easily explained. The gentleman is seen in the field with his dog and a gun, an equipage in which they often see themselves, and which, on that account, seems to shorten the distance between him and them. But the splendor of the drawing room and the elegance of his own dress raise him in their eyes to his natural elevation, and so they come timid and abashed into his presence. Thus the gun compels all ranks and conditions of men, and as far as diversion forms any difference among them, and those in the inferior stations of life who sport with it are more numerous than those in the higher, the meanness it derives from the former quite attain the honor it might pretend to from the latter. All, all the common people are smit with the love of burning powder and scattering lead, they roam over our hills and plains, treading in paths which anciently were to elves and heroes only known. They make the welkin ring an ignoble noise, burst from rusty firelocks vile. Every bowing shopkeeper and pale-faced mechanic get short coats, old muskets, and reprobate setters, and steal away once or twice a week and masquerade from their lawful business to make war on those beasts of the field and the fowls of the air. The more herds also look after their cattle in the same accoutrements. And the farmer, stimulated by the recital of their exploits, deserts his plow and strides over the heath in quest of adventures. Hence it happens that a well-bred man, when he fancies he decries a noble lord whom he wants to salute and his attendants at a distance, is surprised to fall in at last with the moving group of tailors, barbers, and shoemakers, clumsily travestied into a ridiculous similitude of men of vivacity, fire, and blood, by a mistake of the same kind, when he imagines he sees one of his neighbors at the summit of a remote hill whom he wishes to join, he is sadly disappointed on coming up to discover a weather-beaten, thick-boned, mutton-fisted clown with a musket jap hand over with foot laid across his stooping shoulders. Since, therefore, the diversions of gentlemen are descended to the vulgar, instead of marking gentility, they degrade it and expose it to some ridicule by some whimsical re-encounters as I just now mentioned. It is my way, when I want to know the nice point of propriety in any case, to look into the conduct of the ladies in which I seldom miss finding something which directs me to it, and I cheerfully embrace this opportunity of mentioning it to the glory of the sex, that where decency and delicacy and dignity of sentiment and behavior are in question, they never fail to decide with the most beautiful precision on the right side. The rapid succession of their fashions and dress demonstrates how tenacious the ladies are of the characteristics of their rank, which are in hourly danger of being vulgarified by the too quick imitation of servile and mean females. Whenever this happens, they study a new dress, and whereby cut off all comparison between themselves and chambermaids, and cinder which now proud of inventions which their superiors have abandoned. This behavior of the ladies is truly noble and spirited, and the application of it to the present case is so obvious that I need not enlarge on it, as they leave off the use of any fashion which the vanity of the lower part of the sex. Gentlemen will see that they ought to abstain 
from a diverfion which has acquired an air of meanness from having fallen among the dregs of people, Faulconry is ready to afford them an entertainment infinitely above what the pointer and gun can bestow, an entertainment becoming a gentleman, inaccessible to the populace, a productive of the highest luxury of sporting. Nor can gentlemen insinuate themselves so agreeably any other way as by falconry into the good graces of the ladies, who are all fond of this ancient, noble, and delightful recreation. It is my felicity to be known to several women whose distinguished virtues are honorable to their sex and ornamental to their rank, who favor the hawks with their presence and regard their flights with a sprightly lisette. Who favor the hawks with their presence and regard their flights with a sprightly admiration. From them the sports of sky receive a delicate polish and the most joyous vivacity. The hardy, nimble, sonorous falconer feels his sport most exhilarating and delightful when refined gallantry prompts his endeavors to please female youth, beauty, and innocence. The animated spring of his limbs and the lively current of his blood, despite the chilling flood, the steep mountain, the craggy rock, the trembling bog, the prickly thicket, when his heart beats eager to show the charmers the wonders of his art. Thus the ladies, wherever they appear, inspire an ambition for excellence, and their approving smiles richly reward every effort the men can make to entertain them. The second consequence of the gun, which I mentioned, is the destruction of the game. Not indeed by gentlemen who have a legal title to the sports of the field, but by those who confer on themselves the honor of that appellation, and by their inferior poachers. The illicit use of the gun is at present risen to such a daring pitch that unless the laws, widely provided against it, be put in execution without mercy, there shall not, in a few years, be found a pole or partridge in the whole kingdom to draw a trigger or fly hawk at. But neither this nor the confusion of ranks are the only bad consequences, though, to be sure, very deplorable, which are to be apprehended from the prevailing passion of all men for the gun. I look forward, with fear and anguish, to another consequence before which these must lose all of their importance. I mean, the ruin of our happy constitution in both church and state, which heaven avert. Shooting on wing trains up an incredible number of stout fellows to the knowledge of firearms, and to the love of idleness and low debauchery. From these arises, in peaceable times, a constant succession of smugglers and robbers to supply the places of those delinquents who are prematurely cut off by the immoderate use of brandy or the gallows. Now, should it be the affliction of a distant posterity to be visited with the civil war, these rogues would not find it very difficult to advance to the top of their vocations and commence upon plungers of professed cutthroats. These are not to be compared to the fair and honest soldier, who meets you on equal terms, who, while he seeks your life for the sake of public safety and justice, bravely ventures his own to your indignation. They, on the contrary, will attack your property in a defenseless hour of sleep, or shoot you from behind a bush while you are enjoying the sweet serenity of a summer's morning in your nightgown and slippers. End part one of introduction. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part two of introduction of a treaty of modern falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. This consequence of poaching is, I confess, but a mere possibility at present, and am willing enough to join with everybody in regarding it as a very chimerical one too. But still I cannot get it out of my head that the causes which at last brought to the ruin of many empires and kingdoms, now to be found only in history, were at first no more than possibilities 
as little dreaded as the one under confideration. Such, therefore, as are big with horrible calamities, cannot be too warily guarded against, nor will the wise nation, who have at heart the felicity of distant generations, look on them with indifference. People are too apt to read ancient history without learning that small causes often give origin to the most terrible revolutions in human affairs. Shooting on wing is in the opinion of people of superficious reflection, productive of no other effect whatever than the death of a hare or a bird, without ever extending their views to the awful consequences mentioned above. Thus, the man who plants trees little imagines that some of the seedlings which he carries in his hand may be destined to furnish the pillory or gibbet on which his great-grandson is to suffer pigmy or death. In the same manner, the man who gives his infant son a dice-box to rattle for his amusement is not aware that he may thereby infuse into his young heart a passion for gaming which shall one day reduce him to beggary to the highway and to the devil since then poaching is ruinous to gentility and to the game it may be so to the nation also to the interests of falconry and of posterity call loudly for every man of weight and authority to suppress that enormity noble men and gentlemen ought to encourage informations against poachers of all kinds to bring them to immediate conviction and make them feel the salutary rigor of the laws this procedure and i observe with pleasure the spirit within it is attended to in this country will at once save the game from extermination and posterity from the perdition which may be caused by any army of marksmen always ready to start forth as soon as rebellion shall sound her trumpet further by wrenching the gun out of the plebeian hands and putting it into those gentlemen alone this engine will be divested of its present dishonor and acquire an air of dignity then it may be used by those who either have no taste for falconry or are unequal to the expense of that glorious diversion or would throw the pleasure of variety into their sports I proceed now to lay before my kind and indulgent readers some particulars relative to falconry which have long been hid from our sportsmen, either in their libraries, of their curious, or in remote countries. I hope that, while he peruses the following stories, he will constantly reflect they bring to his knowledge matters which happened in times and places very different from his own. There is a versatility in the human imagination which always hurries on to change the situation of things and to bestow on them new arrangements which however it is breathless till it have altered to others that in their turn must yield to new successors hence it is that the politics manners languages learning dress cookery building sports and opinions of our times are so different from those which obtained among the ancients there were many things common among men which now seem so entirely opposite to our taste and practice that we can hardly give credit to them and were it not for the authority of the writers who record them should be put all the long list of fables and romances what i have remarked with regard to antiquity is to be applied to the present state of remote nations which are in numberless customs as contrary to us as if they had existed fifty thousand years ago the candid and intelligent reader will therefore grant it to be exceedingly unfair to argue the absurdity or impossibility of ancient or foreign fashions and events from their opposition to what he sees in vogue among his own neighbors would it not be too rash a conclusion that because the ancients had no smoke jacks they were unacquainted with roast beef or because the turks wear no hats they go all bareheaded while my reader avoids this sort of false criticism he will not hesitate to give his hearty assent to the following narration but if anything appear too powerful for his belief i encourage him to consult the authors whence it is extracted 
I am not of the mind of your slanderous and tattling gossips, who always pretend to bound to conceal the names of the very good authorities on which they tell their venomous tales, when in fact they have not any better authority than their own diabolical imaginations to produce. No, no, where I dare not, or am ashamed to produce my authority, I shall evermore think it manly to suppress the darling story, which even those who gave it do not choose to acknowledge. Here I might mention, to very good purpose, Nimrod and Esau, as the earliest sportsmen of whom we have any knowledge, in proof of the antiquity of sporting, and in order to confer in that important value which the flux of time, even independent of every other consideration, is well known to bestow on families, as well as on books, medals, and statues. When these gentlemen lived, the world was a good deal more than two thousand years old, a tract of time in which the industrious could hardly fail to light on all the different sports of the field, which were their own serious business. It is true, a mighty deluge swept away out of the world all the human race, whose depravity rendered them unworthy of existing any longer on the face of the earth. None were saved except Noah and his family, whose virtues preserved them from the general devastation to repeople the defoliate globe. They could not but have seen and understood the antediluvian diversions, and these would sometimes enter into their conversations and be learned thence by their children. If we may suppose they were acquainted with hound hunting or killing fowls with bow and arrow, there is no reason for denying them the knowledge of hawking. As animals of almost all kinds increase faster than men, these last, yet few in number, would be obliged to take every method to hinder the too quick multiplication of the former. One of these methods, very probably, was hawking, an amusement which, once invented, is so sublime and noble that it would never fall into the entire destitute and must therefore have descended among the other sports of the field. To Nimrod and Esau, in whose hands it would lose none of its dignity, we cannot easily, at this distance of time, tell exactly at what period of the antediluvian world children gave the original hint of falconry, nor lay down the rules according to which the patriarchs trained their hawk. If the two pillars were extant, the one of brick and the other of stone, on which Seth inscribed the prophecies of Adam and the knowledge of his own days for the edification of posterity, perhaps I should be able to throw some light on these curious and abstruse points. It cannot be imagined without derogating from the character of that excellent and primeval gentleman, that he omitted falconry among the many sciences which found a place in his pillars, and it will ever be deplored by all genuine sportsmen as an irreparable misfortune that they were not able to withstand the corroding power of years. This loss would have been less severely felt had Nimrod or Esau put pen to paper and written in their leisure hours treaties of falconry, containing on their own practice and that of their ancestors for the instruction of future sportsmen. Since, however, the pillars of Seth are now perished, and we know of no books written by Nimrod or Esau, the reader will permit me to say that the patriarchs, if they followed nature in their practice, must have trained their hawks nearly on the principles which are delivered in the ensuing treaty. And if they did not follow nature... Time has done little harm in depriving us of their blunder. Hawking is not spoken of by any author with precision till the beginning of the ninth century, when, when Aaron Bombam Bolberus reigned over the vast empire Trebizond, and Nestorius flourished in poetry. Those who want to know more of this extraordinary prince may gratify their curiosity by consulting the authors who have written his history when they have time to rummage any great library where they are preserved, it is well known that the finest collection of these authors on earth in the Grand Sultan's Library, it may be readily found as they are on the same shelf with a complete copy of Livy, for a transcript of which Louis the Fourteenth offered a hundred thousand ducats. It is 
not as a sovereign, but as a sportsman, that I am to consider the emperor of Aram Bomberbobers, the character wherein he is also considered by the poet Nestorius, from whom footnote the pronoun I in this place is to be understood of the translator of the following poem, not of the author. I shall transcribe his method of sporting. It is of no consequence to the unlearned to know the life of this poet, and it would be a front if to the learned to suppose they are ignorant of it. However, if anybody is very curious to peruse it, they will obtain ample satisfaction from the famous Frederick Van Bose, to whom the world is indebted for an accurate and splendid edition of the works of this sublime poet. He wrote on hunting, hawking, and fishing in three several poems, and it is from the beginning of the second that the following translation is made, which I lay before the public, not as a critic, but as a falconer. I well know that a poet cannot be properly rendered into another language, but by another poet, of a temper and genius similar to his own. But I hope the learned reader will pass an indulgent eye over my mistakes, on account of my zeal to entertain him, and forbear to censure too severely a man who has spent most of his time in the field for inelegancies of style. There are some Greek expressions in this poet about the sense of which I am in some doubt, and I should consider it as a great favor if the learned in that language would clear them up to me in private letters with their usual tenderness and humanity. My errors, alas, flow not from obstinacy, but from weakness. And if he is my friend who helps me to correct them, let us now attend to the poet. The fields coursed o'er with horse and hound and horn, and the surrounding hills shaken from their deepest roots by thundering voices of the hunter train, spurning the earth and to the sky ascending their aerial sports. I now prepare to sing propitious smile on my sublime attempt and spreading out thy wings. O soaring goddess, from where Apollo pours the cheerful day to where he plunges in the briny wave, spring with me into imperial regions and support my too adventurous flight. To my poetic eyes, O towering goddess, thy beauteous form present, arrayed as when thou issuest forth from assembled deities, who all in jovial mood neglect the care of universal nature, and seek to solace themselves with the delights of falconry, or on the lofty summit of Olympus, or on the frozen sides of Caucasus, or along Tempe's flowery plains. Yes, yes, I now behold three majestic, thy head adorned with bonnet of azure dye, to which the ostrich has added his waving plumage. Gorgeous, thy body apparelled, in vast and mantle short of liveliest green, at once displaying female elegance and manly vigor and sweet proportion, blended thy limbs and circled from the skirts of thy garments down to thy knees, and the colors of heaven's arch duly mingled are free to climb the mountain's brow or fly through the windings of the vale. And on thy left hand fits erect the bird of mighty Jove, in conscious dignity, as sovereign of the feathered race, reigning wide from the abodes of men, up the thrones of the immortal gods. The fun had just from the eastern gates of light burst forth, and his diverging beams streaked the scattered clouds with dazzling gold, and tingled the limpid dew on the mountains, topped with the various luster of all the gems, which sparkle on the taper fingers of wealthy maidens. Aram Bombam Boberus, Trevisan's dread and unconquerable monarch, issued from the lofty portal of this stately palace to seek the pleasures of the princely sport by flying at the bounding deer, the impetuous king of birds, Aram Bamboberus, whose bulk and strength would more than match the bulk and strength of ten heroes, bore in his hand an eagle, hatched in the frightful cliffs of the Mono-Motapian mountains, 
and in fize proportional to his imperial lord. Old defiance flashed from his piercing eye, and death in all its horrors seemed prepared to spring from his massy beak and grasping talons, filling the various tribes that cut the yielding air with towering dread, tremendous even to the human sight and power. His hood, lined with the softest velvet, was adorned with burnished gold. From the top arose a tuft of seed pearls, pure as the dew on the bending grass, strung on silver threads, and from the gold below shone a blaze of rubies, topazes, and diamonds, that Phoebus, in his meridian glory, might contemplate with envy and admiration. On his legs tinkled twenty silver bells, whose sounds, clear, loud, and melodious, emulated the music of the celestial fears, and poured harmony over the listening country to a compass of five miles around his flight, filling every mortal with ecstatic wonder and transport. With a collar of gold stuck at equal distance from the sharpest spikes of steel, his neck was armed, and on his breast was fixed a plate of the same precious metal, where, amidst festoons of flowers admirably embossed, was seen Aram Bombam Boberus's awful name. Thus fortified, he regarded the disdain of the haggard eagles and Monomotapa that dared to encounter him in the ethereal spaces, and made them, after the first onset, fly from his fierce impetuosity with rapid speed, astonishing the deafened world with their horrible shrieks. Such was the costly furniture of the imperial eagle, which, as he perched on his master's fist, reared his lofty head seven yards in height from his pounces, and, by his hearkening attitude, seemed impatient for his prey. The Trebizonian monarch, attended by a hundred and twenty falconers, swift of foot and of lungs indefatigable, and also by three hundred and sixty youths to beat the cover, appeared among his joyous train in towering majesty, as a sturdy oak that braved the rage of a hundred winters rears its spreading top above a plantation of young trees, the tender the tender nurslings of a few summers, away the hide to the field, two hundred sure footed spaniels traversing the grounds, and soon arrive at the destined scene of the sport, for which their eager hearts panted impatient. That day the winter confined themselves to their caverns, all except soft breathing Zephyr, who gently shook the leaves of the trees and curled the glassy surface of the pool with his tempered breezes. But too weak was Zephyr to lift into the air the vast weight of the imperial eagle and give his far-extending pinions room to play. Yet this unseasonable calm could not have struck the emperor's pleasure. For what can resist the will supreme of the great Arambam Boberus? This mighty prince had ordered to be drawn to the field by forty horses, a vast pair of bellows made of the hides of three hundred bullocks, which he had slain in hecatombs of Elus. The blustering tyrant of the tempest, at his accession eighty years before the throne of August, Barca rang glam king pink o de Bodicus, the potent founder of the Trebizonian Empire. These bellows, firm, close, and capacious, could at any time supply the pace of the natural winds and throw the atmosphere into all the confusion of the most outrageous storms. Nor are they wanting who do not hesitate to aver that they even gathered the clouds and drew down overwhelming deluges of rain from the parched firmament. The dogs had now, by their call, roused the timid herds of deer from their cover and made them fly lighter than the breeze up and down the forest, seeking safety from the dangers with which they were attacked on every side. The air was at the same time darkened by flocks of birds which were pursued by three hundred hawks of noble iris that have long frequented the ancient pines wherein some venerable castle is embosomed, decrying the aiming archer at a distance, rise up over the hovering wing in a sable cloud over the habitations, and in a twilight dim 
involve all objects underneath them. The hollowing of such numerous train of falconers, the whooping of the youth who beat the cover, and the ringing of four hundred bells of shrillest sound made the hills, the vales, and the surrounding vault of heaven echo to each other, and animated the air with gleesome noise and uproar. The imperial bellows, bellows that not the mountain cheek Boreas might contend against. Without the dread of seeing himself outblasted, he was now set up by a hundred men, and prepared to show Aeolus he was not god of all the winds, but held a jurisdiction over them, shared with the illustrious Arambombam Boberus. This magnanimous potentate placed himself a furlong from the brazen muzzle of, of the prodigious machine, standing a little aside, to receive the full hurricane of the breast of his eagle, on which he was to rise with spread sail to the spacious sky. Thrice proclamation was made by the far-sounding voice of Aaron Bombam Boberus, that all the company should retreat behind the bellows, lest the blast should raise his brave falconers and assistants into the air, and letting them afterwards fall, dash them in pieces against the earth. No sooner did the well-known accents of their lord reach their ear than sensible of the danger of the lingering behind. They all ran with the utmost speed from the woods, and hills and vales, whither their ardor for the sport had carried them, and attended by their faithful dogs, soon arrived breathless, where the vast bulk of the bellows rose conspicuous to direct their steps. Thus, when the north-west wind obscures the meridian, a fulgence of the sun with blackening clouds, and moistens the air with chilly dampness, shed from his sable wings, the laborious bees, precious of their gathering storm, forsake the alluring sweetness of every flower, and with hollow murmurs crowd for shelter to their hives from the impending deluge, wisely preferring safety to voluptuousness. Arambombam Boberus, looking round from his gigantic height, and seeing his men and dogs all secure, ordered with a voice that never met with disobedience, the most vigorous hundred of his train to work the bellows, that his eagle, impatient for blood and sport, might poise himself in air and scatter consternation throughout the hills and forests. Quick as the imperial mandate struck their ear, they seized with sinewy hands the long and massy levers wherewith the engine was wrought, and uniting all their force, unfolded manly circling plies, and the numerous hinges of its frames creaked grating as they turned. Now, with redoubled efforts and swelling muscles, they pull down the mighty levers, and fray a tempest bursts from the blows, with hideous din, and rages with boundless fury over the sea and land. Trees are torn from their roots, the standing corns are dissipated over the face of the earth, and a fleet of smyrene merchantmen are dashed against the pitiless rocks, now the nymphs run up and down the mountains, hollowing for the ruined shades. The husbandmen, with loud lamentations, implore from heaven their vanished hopes, and the sailors, whom the boisterous sea had spared to want and misery, bemoaned their calamities in anguish and despair. This blast, so destructive to everything else with it, in its violence, no sooner reached the eagle's breast than his lord, with a quick hand, struck his hood and gave him to behold the refulgent beams of Phoebus, which his race alone can eye with steady gaze. This mighty bird, posterity will doubt of the wondrous truth, expanded his long wings full fifteen yards, and mounting on the artificial storm, soon got up to a height from which he commanded a view, not of Trebizonian realms only, but also of half the spacious globe. Happy in being restored to liberty, and to the blessed light of day, he expressed the satisfaction of his heart in playful gyrations which encompassed a thousand kingdoms, now gliding serene on his motionless pinions, and then cutting his lofty way through the air, out thundering the voice of Jove at every stroke of his wings. But bloodless fight could not long rejoice the high-spirited bird, thirsting for consequence and renown. He darted his far-seeing eyes downwards, 
and beheld, among the swift inhabitants of the forest, a buck whose sleek coat, swelling haunches, and branching horns tempted his gorge, and provoked his valour to seize him as prey. Meanwhile, the multitude of falconers and assistants, but chiefly the towering Aram Bombam Boberus, whose voice alone he obeyed, gazed on his wheelings, and traversing through the air with high admiration and loud applause, and were racked with impatience to see him exert his vast strength and undaunted courage. Nor did they wait long, for, contracting his wings and clapping them almost close to his sides, he shot obliquely through the air, quick as a meteor darts across the starry heavens, when the moon denies her glare to benighted mortals, and in his rapid career seizing the buck that little dreamed his fate was so near, he, with loud reverberating wing, soon regained his former height, exulting in his prowess and success. The Trebizonian eagles, of which he had sacrificed many to his wanton cruelty, descrying him thus burdened with his prey, would take this opportunity of avenging on him the blood of their kindred, by assaulting him in a condition which they fondly imagined would make him yield to their combined strength and give up a life which continually threatened their own destruction. Infatuated birds, and doomed to multiply the triumphs of the Monomotapian eagle, as whizzes through the gloomy sky the blast which proceeds the rolling thunder and startles the thoughtful traveller, so were heard the founding wings of many a wrathful eagle, flying to pour its hottest vengeance on the common tyrant of the air. The battle was maintained on both sides at first, with almost equal advantage, but the eagles increased so fast in number and fought with so much impetuosity that the event became doubtful to mortal eyes and now the monarch trembled for his bird lest overpowered by so great an army of enraged foes he should receive the stroke of death and fall down at his feet a lifeless carcass but jove the venerable fire of gods and men placing the furious combatants in the eternal seals of fate had adjudged the victory to the mighty bird of Africa, which weighed down all his enemies, as a rock outweighs the pebble that is polished by the murmuring brook. The eagle of Aaron Bombam Boberus held his prey in one foot, and fought with the other as long as he could, but his adversaries, pressing thicker and bolder on him, he retreated, defending himself till he was over the place where his master was an anxious spectator of the engagement and then dropped the buck hard by him in token of his love and homage to his protector. They, perceiving him to yield, thought the day their own, and the cowards, which had hovered about the skirts of the combat, now flocked to the pursuit, in order to share in the glory of a victory which they had done nothing to gain. But the imperial bird, now free from every encumbrance, sprang, keen as the gleam of lightning, into the hottest of the battle, fending at every stroke of his talons, one of his foes shrieking to the shades below, to bemoan the folly of waging such unequal war. In vain they tried to tear his neck and gorge, which were defended by his collar and breastplate. By the rash attempt, they only put themselves within his reach, whence no creature worthy of his resentment, or proper to assuage his hunger, ever expected with life. As thick as falls the flakes of snow on the Hyperborean mountains, where reindeer, secure from the monomotapian eagle's ravenous gorge, transport the traveler, sudden as the illusion of a dream over the frozen surface, so thick fell the carcasses of the Trebizonian eagles from the sky, and strewed the fields with ghastly images of death. The remaining flew, struck with a panic by the fate of their unhappy friends, sought safety and speedy flight, and winged their way, full of mingled sorrow and revenge, to hide their heads in their native rocks. The eagle of Aram Bombam Boberus, left master of the sky, wheeled round the plains of war thrice, in token of his victory, and then, lured by a buck's head held high up to him by the monarch, he darted immediately down to his hand, and received the recompense and applause he had so nobly won by his spirit and bravery. End part two of introduction. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
of Introduction of a Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. This poem I have translated as faithfully as my knowledge of the original Greek would give me leave, and if this attempt, with all the faults of it, which men of brighter parts than mine will readily discover, shall prompt some able hand to publish Nestorius in a poetic dress to the world. I won't doze the vanity of regarding my pains as not useless to public entertainment. If my brother sportsmen receive a pleasure from this extract equal to what I have always derived from it, there is no doubt but that some one of them, in whom a liberal education has given the last polish to a fine genius, will gratify his unlearned brethren with an elegant version of the whole. The man must be of a phlegmatic constitution whose soul would not open to the raptures arising from the grand ideas of an extensive country diversified into swelling hills covered with forests, into winding valleys divided by rivulets shaded with trees, into opening plains where villages and arable grounds and irregular hedges interspersed with standards amuse the eye and where the prospect is terminated by rocks and mountains rising beyond each other in wild and awful confusion till the blue mists gently ascending from them blend their vanishing tops with the sky then add to these the raptures flowing from the ideas of such a vast train of falconers and assistants under the command and animated to exert their best abilities by the presence of the gigantic Aaron Bombam Boberus, himself keen in the enjoyment of the princely diversion, and ready to pour out his liberties on such as distinguish themselves by their cheerfulness, dexterity, and spirit. Then to think of such a great number of dogs, springing game at every step to two hundred hawks, circling through the air, and eager to attack the fowls as fast as they rose from the thickets. Then the battle of eagles, where was seen all the variety of stratagem and fury which the noblest of birds could display against the largest of their race. Then the varying passions and exclamations and gestures of the beholders, according to the different turns of the combat and their different interests in the opposite sides. Heavens, it is impossible to call up so glorious a scene in the imagination without feeling all the transporting raptures which the sublimest sport is capable of inspiring. These ideas are full of the most exalted enthusiasm. I proceed further to lay before the reader the state of falconry in Persia and Hindostan, as it was in the days of the sapient and anecdotal Abul Faraj. He was given us the following account of it. This writer was, at the beginning of the 13th century, born in Malatia, a city near the source of the Euphrates, and flourished in psychic theology and history. But it is to the last that he owes his renown. Everybody who has read his works in the proper edition must know that the Sophia of Persia, as well as Aram Bombam Bobris, kills deer with his hawks, hawks of egregious strength and bulk. This monarch, says a bull, of illustrious pedigree, disdaining groveling pastimes, pursues the princely diversion of the sky, exalting his high station, and towering as his glorious soul. The way of training hawks to deer in Persia is easy and natural, and may be followed by any person who possesses a deer park. For this purpose, the Sophie falconers employ a wooden lure, made exactly into the form of a deer's head, covered neatly with the skin stripped off the head of the animal, and adorned with a pair of comely horns. Between these and under the skin is first a thin cushion on which they place the hawk, and wherein she sinks her pounces, and the sockets of the eyes below are filled with the eyes of bulls, horses, cows, camels, or of any other large creatures. They teach the hawk to fly to this lure, and as she stands between the horns to bend down her head, and tear out with her beak the eyes that are crammed in the sockets. But in order to accustom the bird to bear the motions of the deer, which are exceeding violent, when the creature feels his eyes attacked, they jog the lure gently at first, 
while she feeds on it, and gradually accelerate the concussions to the utmost quickness. When they have brought her to bear all the disturbance they can give her by the strength of their arms, they fix the lure on the circumference of a wheel, which at the beginning they turn softly, in contrary directions, and proceed gradually to the most sudden jerks. This is the most difficult and severe part of the training of their hawks, and most of them are killed by it. But a hawk which gets safe through it will keep her balance amidst the most irregular shocks any deer can give her. A hawk bred to this perfection is accordingly above all price, and the richest present in the power of the Sophie to make his best esteemed allies. He receives it himself from his principal falconer with the highest pomp and exultation, and his subjects enter into his satisfaction with the sincerest and most sensible demonstrations of joy. Oh, how generous and cordial are your inferiors to you, a great whom birth or accident as often as merit places on the luminous summits of life and entitles to indulgence and respect how solitary and insipid were your enjoyments did they not render them social and exhilarating and poignant by their smiles and participation this cheerful concurrence of theirs with your felicity constitutes them your best friends and benefactors and gives them a claim to your most active gratitude, which your hearts, dissipated by their kindness, often forget to acknowledge. Yes, you are dependent on those among whom you stand so eminent, and bound to return to their bosoms some enlivening drops of that cheerfulness and festivity which they pour without measure into yours. May, therefore, peevishness everlasting tear the soul and gloominess everlasting, darken the visage of the paltry wretch of opulence and distinction, who, with unaccommodating sourness of aspect, censors and dance the harmless mirth of his inferiors, who seek oblivion on their toils and anxieties and gaiety, jest and copious laughter. Thus prayeth most devout elite. Gregorius Abul Farage Eben Aaron Eben Osima. The readiness of the lower ranks of men to go along with the happiness of their superiors is strikingly exemplified in the conduct of the Persians. Whenever their monarch receives a high bred hawk, and I shall describe it for the amusement of such as were never in Persia upon these grand occasions, the great falcon of the crown, having bred a hawk to full perfection, dresses himself in the richest apparel over which he throws the magnificent badges of his office, and walks accompanied with all the inferior officers to present it to his sovereign. The Sophie, advertised of his coming, receives him sitting on his throne, which is surrounded with many a prostrate lord, and takes the noble bird on his fist, where he surveys her with looks of joyous satisfaction. The moment his smiles announce his felicity, the royal palace resounds with the concert of violins, hot boys, clarinets, trumpets, bassoons, flutes, and kettle drums, in which the calls and howlings of the falconers are artfully interwoven with the music, and expressed with surprising liveliness by the instrument. The nobles about the throne then rise up and copy into their own faces the alacrity which brightens and endears that of the prince and each of them having admired and praised the wonderful hawk according to their rank, the last returns it to the great falconer. Then they offer this majesty their humble felicitations on the fortunate event, and place that every hour may dance onward to him, scattering such and in greater instances of good fortune. How great does every trifle appear when it is connected with a great man! He himself grows blind to its real insignificancy, and thinks it as important as the unconcerned part of the world know it to be frivolous. By his viewing it continually in the flattery of those who find their interest in multiplying the number of his agreeable dreams. The value of most things depends on a light and situation wherein they are viewed, not on what they are in themselves. At least with regard to the Sophia's hawk, this is the case. 
The ceremony of presenting the hawk being ended with infinite delight to every mortal who shared in the honor of it, the first secretary of state dispatches couriers to every part of the monarchy to inform the lieges of the inestimable acquisition made by their sovereign, that they may mingle their joys with his. This news fires the loyalty of the different provinces straight, and they delay not a moment to send ambassadors who have approved wisdom and discretion in making bows and compliments to congratulate his majesty on this immense addition to his royal bliss. Universal mirth prevails over the Perusian dominions, demonstrated by bonfires, illuminations, volleys, carousals, and feasts. Feasts not of your ordinary cookery, but where you shall see twenty different dishes of opium dressed with laudanum and poppy sauce. Every mortal who can afford it is now arrayed in a new suit of green, with the image of a hawk set with carbuncles fixed on the tip of the nose, and the poor, to come as near their betters as they can, stitch on their rags such an enormous quantity of grass and leaves that they resemble so many moving loads of hay. The bashfulness of virgins, the reserve of matrons, the solemnity of judges, the reverence of priests, the importance of physicians, the awkward pedantry of tutors, the ferocity of soldiers, the graciousness of fine gentlemen, the elevation of nobility, the stateliness of gentry, all, all prominences of character, sink down and are lost in the pleasing torrent of mirth which flows from heart to heart and penetrates the inmost creeks of the soul. The Persians are now strangers, happy strangers, to the cares and distresses and calamities of life, under which they so lately labored, so absorbed in the joys of the present moment, that they recollect nothing of the past, and never look down the stream of time for the future. Every bosom swells with gladness, every eye glistens with pleasure, every mouth is lengthened with smiles, every tongue warbles the praises of the Sophie and his hawk, and everywhere you see the young and the old, the merry and the sedate, the foolish and the wise, animating the sprightly dance to the sound of footnote. Footnote read. The original words are Parada Simod Carada Mapacock Simod Trampolock and signify the four sorts of quick music in the East. End footnote. Jigs and reels, hornpipes and strath praise. The citizens of Ipahan are all so light, so brisk, so airy, that a single face of the tolerable seriousness could not be purchased among them for ready gold. A stranger would swear these good people had sold themselves to folly and madness. They trip along the streets on their tiptoes with infinite vivacity, and then they snap it with their fingers so cheerily to their own private hummings and whistlings. Nor is the country a jot behind the town and the extravagance of joy on this season of festivity. The nymphs and swains, gambolings and frolickings on the green to the shrill, wild notes of the bagpipe, or to the sweet and melodious twinklings of the harp. Now many a courtship is begun, and many a courtship is completed, and, alas, many a simple milkmaid is qualified in the silent grove to complain of flattering, faithless, and inconstant men and many a lover laughs at the levity of his mistress, and finds happiness in another charmer. These rejoicings continue nine days, and on the tenth the Sophie, in his royal robes and attended by all his court, rides on an Arabian courier with furniture of green velvet curiously embroidered with hawks, to the beautiful plain of Malu Van Nera, where he is received amidst the loud acclamations of thousands of his subjects, assembled from all the provinces of the empire to see the ceremony of swearing fidelity to the royal hawk solemnized. The prince alights from his horse and passes through the ranks of his guards to a glorious throne of the finest workmanship on which he deliberately places his royal body. As soon as he is seated, he is enclosed by his nobles. And verily, it is a comely sight to behold the golden hawk and carbuncles with spread wings nodding on the tip of every nose but that on the imperial nose is composed 
of a variety of precious stones, artfully cemented together, which represent the natural colours of the feathers. Now the great falconer advances, tall, erect, and firm, and, placing the hawk on the top of the scepter, pronounces a learned harangue on the excellence of falconry in general, but expiates, in particular, on the high qualities of the bird, which he had the honour to present to his sovereign lord. He ends his oration with a solemn and confidential wish that the dominion of the hawk may be as extensive and absolute over the forests of deer, and that of the scepter wherein it fit is over the Persian realm. Then the Sophie, holding out the hawk, orders him to lay this foreigner of the right hand under its pounces, and swear the following oath. I Pashur Mirza Kobi Mata Lab Fulman, great falconer of Persia, do swear by the beard of the Sophie, by the pounces of the hawk, and by Trebidar Days, her guardian angel, and I shall be her true and faithful slave, providing her, to the best of my knowledge and belief, in the most wholesome food, and most entertaining sport. But if I shall, at any time, so far neglect my charge as that she may be in the least suffer by my carelessness, may I become the victim of her vengeance in this world, and drop at the last day from the narrow bridge into the blue flaming billows, which boil from the torment of all frothful and heedless falconers. This oath is afterwards administered to all the under falconers and other offices of the royal muse. Such alterations, being made in the form as the respective posts render necessary and proper, then he who is appointed body physician to the hawk cometh forward with a right grave, solemn step, and having undergone an examination on all the diseases and cures of hawks, he has also sworn into his place. Whilst the ceremony lasts, not a cough or whisper is heard to disturb the still attention which is so suitable to his awfulness and dignity. The eager curiosity of the whole multitude is centered in it, every mortal stretching out his neck and darting piercing looks to the important scene. You might in this calm hear the softest down of a feather fall to the earth. The ceremony being finished, the onlookers are dismissed by the sound of trumpets, who, as they go away, wish, in pealing exclamations, the Sophie many such hawks, and an endless rain to enjoy them. This potentate flies these noble birds in vast forests well stocked with deer, which they attack with incredible impetuosity. As soon as they descry their prey from the heights of the air, they stoop on it with the rapidity of lightning, and taking their station between its horns, aim directly at its eyes. The creature, finding itself thus assailed, runs and bounds and tosses its head in order to shake off its enemy. But the well-trained hawk keeps her hold amidst all these agitations, as little molested by them as if she were a part of the animal itself. At last, she not only tears out the eyes, but penetrates even to the brains. And it is the amusement of the spectators to mark the varying turns of the struggle between the deer and the hawk, till the former is killed. Nothing can exceed the care and assiduity wherein the falconers and physicians look after the royal hawks for the penalty of their oath. Whatever may be their state in the next world is inflicted by the utmost severity, as far as it is in regards to the present. If it appear that the loss or death of any of these birds is occasioned by their negligence, the offender is sewed up in the deer skins, which horns fixed to its head and thus turned out to the rage of the hawks. These, mistaking the disguised criminal for a deer, fly at him with their usual fierceness, pull out the eyes, and put him to the most excruciating death. The dread of this horrible fate renders the officers of the royal muse remarkably attentive and skillful in their duty, and guards the hawks from perishing by any ailment except old age. The attachment of the Sophie for falconry is equaled by that of his Ottoman Highness, who does great honor to the princely sport. 
This monarch maintains at a very high expense a train of footnote. The curious reader will find this fact also in Chambers' Dictionary. Fix thousands of falconers. The lovers of calculation will thence be enabled to form an idea of the wealth of this prince, as well as of his affection of the sports of the sky. Each falconer is able enough to take care of three hawks, and these require three spaniels to spring game and fix lads to beat the cover. Multiply these numbers, then, by the number of falconers, and you will see that the august protector of Mahomet's religion has in his pay 42,000 men in all. In his muse, 18,000 hawks, and in his kennels, the same number of spaniels. The subsistence of one falconer, six lads, three hawks, and as many spaniels is cheap at nine shillings a day. The product of this moderate sum, multiplied by the number of falconers, amounts only to 2,700 pounds sterling a day. Multiply this daily expense by the days of a year, and you will plainly discover that the commander of the faithful annually lays out 900 and eighty five thousand and five hundred pounds this is without doubt a considerable deal of money but i could have made the sum much higher had i thrown into the splendid appointments of the officers of the train as exaggeration however has always been my utter aversion i have forborne to swell the account with this additional expense and from the same principle I shall not be angry at any gentleman who may think fit to cut away from the total of the odd eighty five thousand and five hundred pounds. The great expense of the grand seigneur's train of falconers would merit no credit, were we not certain that he can command the wealth of many kingdoms to supply it. The bowstring is to him a source of more wealth than the king of Spain draws from Mexico and Peru, and much more within his reach. Besides his fair and established revenues, he squeezes immense sums from the Bashaws for their governments. They, in turn, squeeze the people in order to reimburse themselves, and he afterwards puts an end to the lives of these inferior oppressors for the sake of their treasures. Thus, justice gives him possession of a part of the wealth of his subjects for the support of his government, and he employs tyranny and cruelty to get into his hands the greater part of the remainder. To those, therefore, who consider his wealth, it will not appear extraordinary that he spends a few hundred thousand pounds on the manly pleasure of hawking. On grand hawking days, this prince cannot have in his retinue fewer than seventy or eighty thousand souls. If we add to the falconers and their assistants, the guards and bashaws, and spectators who will attend him, but he seldom goes to the field in all his glory and magnificence, nor is it indeed solely or chiefly for his own private amusement that he maintains such a numerous train of sportsmen. He keeps them principally with a view to the posterity of his empire, which they advance very essentially in a way which will amaze those who are not acquainted with it already. Everybody has heard with great admiration of the fierce impetuosity wherewith the, the Janizaries charge their enemies in battle. But it is a piece of information to perhaps most people that these troops owe their egregious bravery to the virtue of five falcon eggs, which each man takes twice a week to breakfast in time of war. Hawks are, of all the feathered tribes, the most undaunted and enterprising, and these heroic qualities they communicate to those who eat their eggs. It is superfluous to prove to such as know the wonderful effects of beef on the British soldiery that the fearlessness of the mind is sometimes created, and always promoted by the excellence of the food which is taken into the body. Fill the most timid coward who ever shrunk from the face of danger. Fill him with roast beef and strong beer, and he will run up to a battery of cannon 
in the hotteft fire. The Turks have two forts of falcon eggs for inspiring their Janizaries. The one fort is produced by falcons which are fed on ordinary food, and the other by falcons which are fed on extraordinary food. The firft fort is allotted to men who possess that share of courage with which nature endues the generality of mankind. But the laft is assigned to your constitutional cowards. As for native heroes, they eat neither sort. It may be asked, from a very reasonable curiosity, by what method do the Turks discover the different tempers of their soldiers, so as to adapt the eggs to each man's state of mind? This question merits an answer, and I shall give it before I proceed any further. You must know that in each regiment of Janizaries there are established six aged philosophers, deeply experienced in all the modifications of the human heart, in whose hands are put all the young officers and recruits. These philosophers, to the most piercing sagacity, join the most winning candor of heart and sweetness of manners, and therefore soon insinuate themselves into the love and confidence of those who are placed under their inspection. As they are persons of the most scrupulous and benevolent discretion, and left to perform the duties of their office in a way which their own wisdom determines to be best without fear of censure, the youth committed to their security are under no apprehensions of having the weak parts of their characters exposed to the world. Besides, were they once found guilty of such ridiculous folly and unnecessary cruelty, they would be turned with ignominy out of their places, for the Turks are such odd mortals as to reckon backbiting a certain mark of cowardice, and they hate cowardice worse than the devil. The great aim of these sages is to discover the natural and prevailing bent of the young men, and that they may the more easily find it out. They allow them to act in whatever way they please, in all places, and on all emergencies, knowing that the restraint and austerity more frequently teach them to disguise than to correct their passions. By this simple method, they soon arrive at the knowledge of the different dispositions of the juvenile candidates for military fame, and give them such eggs as are suited to their dispositions. Thus, if a young officer or recruit takes pleasure in learning the use of his arms, and keeps them bright and in fighting order, if he obeys his superiors with smiling alertness, and is beloved by all his comrades, if he never provokes a quarrel, nor ever tamely submits to an avowed affront, this character ranks him among men of genuine spirit and courage. But if, on the contrary, he is found to delight in a part of challenging arrangements of features to affect stately, overbearing, and neglectful manners, to be boasting, vainglorious, and valorous in conversation, to listen to defamatory insinuations, and to be learned in slanderous anecdotes, to treat his inferiors with abuse of acrimony, and his superiors with cringing flattery, to be covetous, niggardly, and curmundingly, in short, to be very full of himself, and very disdainful to all who would choose to oppose him. Our philosophers declare a man of this silly disposition a coward of the lowest and most despicable order. Here I must observe that they do not pass judgment on the whole character from single or occasional indications of heroism or pusillanimity, but from the general train of it. There being moments when a hero sinks into a coward, and when a coward feels himself a hero, to his utter astonishment. I now proceed to explain the way by which the Turks obtain the necessary quantity of eggs, and how they prepare them. The immense number of falconers and assistants, whom I have already mentioned, are cantoned out among the mountains and rocky provinces of the empire to gather falcon eggs during the summer and to put the areas into proper order the rest of the year, that long flights for food may not fatigue and disable the hawks for laying. Great droves of dogs are sent from every quarter of the empire to the deserts, where they are killed and distributed 
in pieces at midnight to all the eyries. By this economy, the falcons hardly ever stir out, except when their health calls for exercise, or so being vigorous, they lay each of them an egg a day. They are, at the beginning of the season, permitted to lay four or five eggs without being robbed. But every day after, the falconers rob each eyrie of a single egg. The birds, prompted by nature, continue laying, in order to complete the number at which they hatch. And these people continue the robberies in order to delay the completion of that number. But when they perceive the birds are growing weak, and the season far gone, they allow them to lay the full number to which instinct directs them for the preservation of their breed. In that warm climate, falcons seldom lay fewer than seven or eight eggs, whereas in the colder regions of the north, they never produce more than two or three or four. As soon as the falconers take up the eggs from the nest, they dip them in melted wax, of which they receive a coat that excludes the air, and saves them from putrefaction. These are the sort of eggs which are appointed for men of ordinary spirit, with a view to exalt them into heroes. End part three of introduction. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Four of introduction of a treaty of modern falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. But there is another sort, as I've already mentioned, which is prepared for the sole use of natural cowards in the following manner. The tick is a small animal of a dark color, flat body, and sharp snout, which it sinks into the skin of men or dogs. Then it remains immovable, sucking nutritious juices, causing a painful itching, till it swells to the size of a chestnut, and then falls off, changing into a dirty whitish hue. These insects are found in great numbers on the grass and low shrubs, and the falconers collect them by lying naked on the ground, from which they creep in multitudes on their bodies. They brush them immediately off before they fix themselves into a large vessel of white chinaware, and thus gather them into a cup filled with lees of wine. Here their appearance rises imperceptibly to a bright, flaming red. Their motions grow amazingly irregular and violent, and at length they emit a very delicate sound, which, by laying your ear close to the cup, you may hear distinctly, sometimes like tender, sometimes like gleesome, and sometimes like martial music. This informs the falconers that the insects have reached the last stage of madness, in at which they take them out of the cup and fix them on each dog, placing them on the veins under the tongue, which, on account of their softness, are easily penetrated and ready to emit the poison. The dogs, when they feel the bite, jump and frisk and gamble up and down their enclosures, all life and joy. But on the third day, when they always look heavy and stupid, the falconers give each of them three drops of the gall of a fiery serpent and a fleck of the wax, which excretes from the ear of a female harpy, both dissolved in fair water. The bite of the tick naturally brings on madness, but this composition throws the body into the universal trembling, deprives the limbs of life and motion, and causes the teeth to fall out. The venom of the insect is produced by inebriation, and it acts so nicely in concert with the mixed gall and wax that the madness into which it throws the dogs is immediately succeeded by death. It is by this method that no harm ever arises to any creature from the fury of the dogs, which would otherwise bite the whole country into a frenzy. These dogs are instantly cut in pieces and distributed as were the former among the iris for the for the production of the most sublimating eggs. When you consider the food of the birds which lay these wonderful eggs, you will not doubt of their power to light up in the breast of even cowardice itself the intrepidity of a hero. This must be the effect when the honest fidelity of the dog and the bloody perseverance of the tick, both stimulated to the keenest madness by the spear of the grape, are joined to the hot ferocity 
of the falcon, and all concentrated into one luminous flame of magnanimity within her eggs. And, indeed, experience makes it evident that from an egg of this sort there passes into the blood of those who eat it such a glorious assemblage of heroic qualities as enables them to look smiling on the most dreadful perils. It swells their imagination with the loftiest ideas of magnanimity and public spirit, and empties them of all selfish regards for their own private concerns and preservation. They pant for the battle when their country is in danger, and exult at the fight of that danger, because bravely to encounter it covers them with glory, whether they fall in the conflict or survive it. Their souls expand heroic as the various terms of the engagement glide before the enraptured fancy and give them the noblest opportunity of signalizing their genuous ardor and steady revelation. They soar on wings of conscious dignity when they look forward to the splendor with which their exploits shall blaze in the eyes of admiring posterity and anticipate the applauses with which their name shall be honored by future poets and historians. Their sole dread is the dishonor of yielding to a foe who menaces their sovereign, their country, their religion, with perdition. And when the weapons of death terminate their glorious career in the combat, they breathe out their undaunted souls with ecstatic joy, able to die for such great and interesting objects, but not to live by deserting them. It is well known that dueling never took place among the Turks. They look on it as the consummation of human folly, to repair honor or to determine between right and wrong, by the blood of one or other of two persons who chance to fall into an unpremeditated quarrel. They cannot conceive how a man becomes a liar, or a villain, or a scoundrel, by receiving these titles from a fellow who has a fontry enough to bestow them nor how he is transformed into a coward by showing himself too magnanimous to set himself on a level with a wrong-headed fool. They are equally at a loss to point out whence arises the propensity of the world to arrange themselves on his side who is so barbarous and stupid as to think it bravery to expose either another or himself to the chance of being murdered for the sake of a different which in even their own opinion, might be more rationally adjusted. They feel themselves groping in the dark when they endeavor to comprehend why two men are trained and supported by their country for its defense against the violence and inroads of its enemies shall be reckoned men of honor in fighting against each other when it is evident that the public is defrauded by the death of either to the amount of their former subsistence. They have heard of the positive laws against single combat, and are amazed by the concurrence of madmen in favor of that, of that absurd custom should render them ineffectual, but at the same time they compassionate every man of genuine sense and bravery whom the insolence of a considerable fool lays under the hard necessity of either drawing his sword against a bundle of pride, indiscretion, and ill temper or of forfeiting his character in public opinion. By what turn of mind the Turks are so much puzzled in considering the subject of dueling, whether by their sense or stupidity, is a point too sublime for me to determine. But of this I pretend to be certain that they condemn the practice unanimously and declare that a man is obliged to preserve his life for the benefit of his country and religion and sovereign and for the sake only to lay it down. This way of thinking which they indulge against dueling is the consequence of the use which the troops make of falcon eggs, whereby they are rendered so brave that they need not fight their own countrymen to establish this character, and so haughty that they think a fellow below their notice whose insolence cannot be otherwise repressed. But, though the eggs under consideration are in general of the highest advantage to the Turkish Empire, instances may be produced wherein they appear to have been perverted to the worst purposes. Those who are skilled in the history of Ottoman princes will recollect several instances of this nature, and, among the rest, 
that of the murder of Ebn Abdul Moldala, Ebn Shiraz, one of the best muftis who ever taught Mussulmen the way to heaven. A scarcity of falcon eggs having happened in the reign of emperor who advanced this worthy musty to his dignity, the Janizaries laid this calamity to his majesty's charge, and on that account deprived him of his crown and life. This horrible treason pointed out the danger of feeding these troops any longer with falcon eggs, and accordingly a plan was concerted in the next reign to take this food from them altogether. The only legal obstacle to the execution of the plan was a passage of the Quran, wherein the right of the Janizaris to falcon eggs was plainly founded, and that the Mufti was obliged to explain away. The imperial command was signified to him with all solemnity, and he knew well he must either obey it or submit to the bowstring. He chose obedience as the fastest measure, and forced his conscience and orthodoxy to bend to the authority of his sovereign. Accordingly, he prepared a labored discourse on this subject. And on an appointed day, the emperor, attended by his court, and all the Janizaris, came to hear him deliver it. He declaimed with much warmth and eloquence against the use of the eggs in question, from the fury into which they inflamed the eaters. He showed, but the concurrent judgment of the most solid and grave commentators, that these eggs were originally intended only to Mohammed's own soldiers, and he made it appear that the money which these eggs cost might be laid out much better in building and endowing mosques and hospitals. His discourse being finished, he declared with an audible voice, Falcon eggs to be incentives to high treason, and every Janizari to be an enemy of his prince and country who should hereafter taste them. Then he promised all the various joys of paradise to those who lived up to the spirit of this declaration, but then threatened the wretches with the bitterest of hell's torments who transgressed it. When it was ended, the emperor and all his courtiers rose up with a holy and exemplary air of devotion and said, Amen. After the venerable Musty, who was greatly edified by this attention to religion in such great men, but the declaration by no means as acceptance to the Janizaris as it was to their monarch and his attendants. They were exasperated that a resolution was taken to rob them of their favorite breakfast. But their patience could hold no longer when they reflected that an old priest who had no right to meddle in their affairs pronounced the injurious sentence. Fury boiling in their heart quaked at every joint, reddened in their eyes, gnashed in their teeth, and made them tear their mustaches with violent hands. The sultan and his retinue, who well understood the meaning of these signs, retired in an order wherein more attention was paid to speed than is consistent with the solemn dignity of an imperial procession. The impious Janizaris, now freed from every shadow of restraint, flew on the holy man, and, after treating him with the coolest insolence, were just going to impale him alive when he begged a moment's audience. After some altercation with another, they agreed to his request, assigning this piece of inhuman raillery as the reason of their compliance, that they had never heard the dying words of the Mufti, and did not know that they might be more diverting than any he had ever spoken in his life. Silence being ordered, the venerable saint addressed them in the following speech. You are going to shed my blood, O ye Janizaris, because I have dissuaded you from falcon eggs for the good of your country. But I predict that the instant I am arrived in paradise, a curse from our great prophet will begin to operate on your bands, and produce its fullest after many revolving years. Hawks will henceforth decrease in the empire, and at length totally abandon it, flying towards that point of the heavens where the sun is never seen, and invigorating with their eggs a nation, which is one day to shake your empire to the very center. Then shall ye O ye Janizaris, and your successors, turn your timid backs to the sword of your enemies, as doth a pigeon to the terrors of the ravenous eagle. They could contain their fury no longer, and immediately afflicted on him every barbarity their relentless hearts could think of. His murder, however, 
and that of his master, had rendered every succeeding mufti very orthodox on the egg text, and every succeeding emperor very attentive to the egg magazines. The hidden spring of these violent disturbances was supposed, not without any good reason, to be Sefer Eben Shamgar Eben Morli, a priest of the most insatiable ambition, which he concealed and promoted under the most sanctimonious veneration for orthodoxy. This man's countenance was, in public, beclouded with austerity and moroseness. His words flowed in censors advices of bitter invectives, and his heart was wrapped in cunning trick and hypocrisy. He flattered the former emperor, who saw into his worthlessness and interested views, in hopes of obtaining the mufti ship. But he flattered him in vain, and, on that account, secretly employed the famine of falcon eggs, which fell out soon after, to inflame the Janizaries to rebellion, which was but too successful. His rival was now the object of his lurking rancor and fury, and he watched for an opportunity to sacrifice him to his disappointed and exasperated ambition. The same of his extraordinary piety and devotion had been published in the Faraglio by the holy tongues of milliners and seamstresses who managed the necessary buffness of the sultanesses in the city and his very advanced age procured him access to that serene abode of beauty in order to give lectures of conjugal fidelity and ghostly comfort to the charming captives he soon opened a path to himself by means of their superstition into their very souls from which he drew the quickest and most certain intelligence of everything that was decreed in the divan and among other resolutions that of depriving the janizaries of their falcon eggs by a declaration of the monkey the secret deluded his heart with joy he immediately began to practice on these troops and soon prepared them for perpetrating that sacrilegious murder which paved the way for his own advancement to the highest ecclesiastical dignity of the empire with this he was solemnly invested the same day his rival went to paradise at the seditious and menacing request of the janizaries to whose outrageous importunity the emperor durst not give a refusal this short detail seemed necessary to explain the former transactions and therefore have i given it which of these two priests was the best man is evident not only from their history but still more striking from the war which flamed so lately between the Russians and the Turks, and is not yet extinguished. It is no secret that falcons are now much scarcer in Turkey and much plentier in Russia than they were formerly, nor that the northern armies have the eggs of these birds in great abundance, while the Mussulmen are in the greatest want of them. A gentleman of unquestioned veracity and great erudition who has free admission to papers concealed from the rest of the world has informed me in the most authentic manner that a flight of hawks from five hundred iris in the wilderness of baharim was seen a few years ago to pass northward to the great sorrow of true mahomedans they lighted among the rocks of russia where they have continued ever since infusing into the disciples of saint nicholas that bravery from their eggs which has enabled them to make the grand sultan tremble on his throne in the middle of his guard and threaten to fell him one day from europe altogether it is from the same worthy gentleman i have also information that the chief obstacle to the peace which these two powerful nations were negotiating was a demand made by the russians from the turks of many thousand falcons as a yearly tribute was the latter absolute refused either from policy or inability the inference from all these particulars is that the monkey's prophecy is now accomplished which implies the villainy of his successor who contrived his ruin the russians have beat the turks on all hands driven them from their own territories drowned them in their own seas and threatened to point their cannon against the walls of constantinople itself victory seems to hover above the hosts of these warriors and leads them on against their enemies to assured glory and conquest 
The advantages of crewing to the Russians from the use of falcon eggs ought to alarm the other powers of Europe for their dependency, and make them enter into the most vigorous measures to set bounds to their ambition. When France first established standing armies, she had in her power to awe and annoy all her neighbors. But as they, sensible of their danger, brought in standing armies too for their security, so ought the breeding of hawks to become the capital concern of every nation at present in order to raise them to their former importance with regard to Russia. After all I have said with regard to falconry in former times and in other countries, I cannot forbear thinking that this science appears more rational in my own time and nation and productive of more amusement than in any other period and people which either prose or verse has brought to my knowledge. But while I applaud and perfect the way of hawking to which I have been bred, I do not mean to disparage the Trebizonian, Persian, or Turkish methods. These, as they are all productive of pleasure to those who peruse them, are, on that account, to be esteemed among the alleviations of human misery. In my own opinion, the man who condemns everything is wrong that does not fall in with his particular notions gives the clearest proof of a narrow mind and he gives an equally clear proof of an haughty arrogant presumptuous disposition if he expects that all men are to conform their various tastes to the standard of his he might with as much reason demand that they should curtail or lengthen their persons to his stature or darken or brighten their faces to his complexion or strengthen or weaken their appetite to his stomach, and be hungry or full, thirsty or refreshed, just when and how he pleased. Amusements are nothing in themselves in any part of the world, but derive all their value from the delight they bestow on those who are engaged in them. Such, however, seem preferable to the rest that throw the body into the most natural and graceful motions and render the mind least sensible the tedious lapse of time thus promoting the vigor of the former and affording the most agreeable relaxation to the latter to qualify both for the necessary and important offices of life this praise is due to falconry in whatever way it is practiced in the different parts of the world the sprightly falconer animated by the love of sport bursting the silken bands of sleep rises as early as the lark and is full of glee and hastens to the forest in quest of health and manly diversion. His spaniels, snuffing the scent of game in the breeze, traverse every thicket with eager impatience, and mingling their call with the encouraging voice of their master, rouse the echo into joyous clamor from every hill and valley. Cheerful hope plays light in his heart, while his eyes encompass and watch looks the scene of sport, and his hawk testifies by her half-spread trembling wings her keenness for the aerial chase. Mark, the dogs have sprung a woodcock. The eager falcon unhoods the bold-eyed bird, and with a cheering whistle slips her at prey. The cock, impelled by the dreaded presence of his enemy to his utmost speed, see, he mounts, he mounts, he mounts to the heights of air, direct as the feathered shaft from the twanging bow. The hawk pursues him, rap, 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 on founding pinions and now breathes with open beak on his train, ready to rise above him. The cock, see, acquires new strength and rapidity from the urgency of the danger behind him, and darts more impetuous towards the sky by the force of terror. The hawk, enraged by his escape, redoubles her speed, and feels herself invigorated for the pursuit by the warmth which her resentment has kindled in her breast. Now, now, they are no bigger than wrens, now they are dwindled to beetles. Now they vanish and appear to the doubtful sight like the twinkling of smaller stars. Now the falconer and his company, prostrated on the grounds with reverted looks, in vain search for them in the expansive air. Thousands of elusive bubbles formed in the atmosphere by the weakened fight, such as mantle on the pool that receives the thunder and cataract, intercept their view with dazzling confusion. The cock, no longer able to urge his upward flight, stretches away in gentle declining direction, while the hawk takes the opportunity 
which fatigue compels him to give her of mounting above him and there there they appear again to the longing sight of the gazing spectators how rapidly the hawk stoops how nimbly the cock buckles see the hawk how quickly she regains the sky there she stoops like a thunderbolt but the cock has once more eluded the blow of death he makes for cover and ah will certainly escape no no down she comes souse on him again his good fortune has deserted him he drops his head near the thicket which the instant before he viewed as his refuge from his foe the falconer and his company pleased with their diversion takes their way home and the landscape varying to their sight as they walk along presents them with the successive scenes of rular beauties to compose their thoughts agitated by the lively pleasure of such a noble and glorious flight here are plains through which rivers cut its way afford pasture to numerous herds of cattle and wind away from their following eyes among the distant hills yonder the rising smoke draws their attention to a village hid in trees and their thoughts the calm felicity of humble life on one side the hollow murmuring of a distant waterfall and on the other the hoarse noise of the forest on the mountain side gently shaken by the wind mingle in the air and breathe serenity into their souls bleak hills rise before them which they with covered with trees and a mouldering ruin decried them from afar puts them in mind of the ancient family which once rejoiced there and alas it is now to be found only in tradition or in the pride of those who claim their defeat from it from these subjects their conversation passes to sporting when they commemorate with great delight the amazing sagacity of spaniels and the astonishing courage of hawks which are now in the dust nor do they forget the diverting jokes and wonderful exploits of former falconers who sported with their fathers and carried themselves yet infants in their arms the ambition of each man to raise his tail above those of his neighbors throws a strong dash of the marvelous into their narrations which the credulous drink in without thought or examination but which persons of penetration oppose with ridicule or argument or with positive contradiction and extravagant bets the debate beginning to grow warm and to set every man's tongue a-going is happily terminated and forgotten by the near prospect of the house where they are to dine and recruit their wanted strength and spirits they are arrived every man repairs to his room to dress and then into a glorious uproar the whole house is cast orders contradictory as at the tower of babel burst from every apartment servants muttering curses against their impatient masters fly up and down stairs with shoes and stockings and bassoons of water and the doors so merrily cracking and clapping would make a stranger imagine the house was occupied by stocking weavers and joiners or some other equally noisy tradesman the bell gives the joyful signal for dinner the company obey the welcome summons and meet together with the health and good humor smiling in their looks and stomach sharp enough to turn bread and water into a feast the hospitality of the landlord and landlady who preside over the entertainment kindly exhorts their guests to make hearty cheer and to forget their fatigues and weariness in convivial enjoyment now a field is open for displaying the soft and gentle contention of compliments in which the victor is recompensed with the inward pleasing sense of his own superior elegance and politeness and the vanquished is consoled by the secret vanity of thinking himself the object of so many favorable turns of eloquence then what social hobbing and nobbing what friendly pressing to make good cheer what complaints of bad weather and bad roads what wise observation on the quality and prices of provisions what curious anecdotes on courtship and marriages amidst this chit-chat hunger is insensibly appeased and now the table is adorned with bottles and glasses the prompters of a more gay and jovial conversation sociality smiles on every countenance good humor wantons to every eye friendship warms every breast and excites an emulation to please and to be pleased the comic tale the polite jest and easy rapture take their turns and make the room resound and every side in the company shake with laughter the joyfulness yields to grave consideration of politics 
The pretensions of all parties are nicely examined and debated, and every man wonders to find himself endowed with wisdom to govern a nation. Then their eloquence expatiates on horses and dogs and roads and races and wines and farms and banks and hunting and planting and coals and lime and dung and a thousand other subjects which follow one another and are discussed in the quickest succession. Thus live falconers, the most kind, generous, and frank of men, devoid of all guile, trick, and cunning, and drawing as much happiness as they can out of life. I shall finish this introduction with just observing that, as there is no relaxation more mainly than hawking, so there is none more innocent or more capable of enlarging the mind. The falconer is always conversant with the noblest objects of nature, the skies, mountains, forests, and rivers, which cannot fail of bestowing dignity and grandeur on his conceptions. From these, his soul receives an elation of thought, which makes him despise everything base and dishonorable, and thus he is prepared to become the ornament and benefactor of society. Post. Postscript. The reader will perceive a difference of style between the following treaties and the preceding introduction. The former being written for practical falconers, requiring plain language, but the latter, being intended to amuse, demanded a more flowery diction both in reasoning and translations. This is my first attempt at an introduction, which is not yet so clever as I hope to make it in the second edition. The capacity I receive from nature for introductions I have indeed carried into habit. That has grown under my hands into a faculty, but I must frankly own that I find the utmost difficulty in advancing to the last stage a complete energy. To the Right Honorable Archibald Earl of Ingleton, My Lord, your love of falconry has made your lordship often regret its decay, and wish for a plain treaty on that subject, which might render its practice easy and induce our nobility and gentry once more to make it their favorite amusement. Your Lordship's kind partiality, I fear, and not my merit, influenced you to flatter me into an opinion that I was not altogether unqualified for this office. How I have succeeded, no one can judge better than your Lordship. There is a kind of an introduction prefixed to it, which, as it has nothing to do with the real practice, and was no part of your Lordship's desire, I presume not to ask your patronage of, but if you, it will any way add at any time to your lordship's amusement i care nothing my lord whether you laugh at me or with me but beg your lordship will not dispute my ancient authorities do me the honor my lord to accept of the treaty itself as a mark of my obedience to your lordship's commands and of the great respect and esteem with which i beg leave to subscribe myself my lord your lordship's most humble and most obedient servant j a campbell End of part four of introduction. End of introduction. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter one of a treaty of modern falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter one of the falconer. Previous to the instructions I am to deliver concerning hawks, I shall briefly point out the qualities necessary in the person who is to manage them. He ought then to be of great strength to bear the fatigue of ascending hills, wading over rivers, pressing through thickets, and of surmounting the other difficulties that may lie in his way. Agility is also requisite, that he may be able to attend his hawks in their flight and to serve them with game while they are hanging over his head in the air in keen expectation of it. As little often outfly his utmost speed, his voice should be clear and loud and in order to be heard at a distance and bring them back to the destined scene of diversion. They demand great regularity in their food and exercises, and that he may be seldom tempted to neglect it. He must be methodical and temperate in his way of living. His love of the sport must be very intense to animate him to undergo, undaunted, the numberless inconveniences of attendance, weather and soil wherewith it is generally accompanied. This will make it his main pleasure to be always with his hawks, training them to obedience, correcting their faults, and consulting their health and beauty. 
To do these things effectually, he must understand their temper and constitution, and ought to possess much patience and mildness in their application of his knowledge. Hawks, under the management of a man thus qualified, will be always in good order for flying, exhibit the greatest boldness and address in chasing their prey, give the highest pleasure to the beholders of their motions, and do just honor to the skill and attention of their keeper. Strength, agility, keenness, and diligence, which are indispensably necessary to the menial falconer, ought also to be found in the gentleman whom he serves. They enable him to bear his part in the sport with becoming manliness, to derive from it all the amusement it can give, and to overawe his servants into the regular and honest discharge of his duty. When the master is ignorant of or inattentive to his hawks, his falconer must be uncommonly skillful and diligent, if they are always ready when he wants them. But if, on the contrary, he be idle, lazy, and careless, he will assign as little as he can of his time and thoughts to his business, depending for impunity on his master's negligence, or on the excuses which he has prepared to impose on his ignorance. The hawks, fed with unseasonable or unwholesome meals, lose their spirit and vigor, and deprived of the regular exercise, forget their obedience, and neglected in their natural and artificial psychic contract diseases which terminate in death. Thus a gentleman who does not understand or does not look after his hawks may throw away much money on them without ever receiving any recreation from them. By reason of his own thoughtlessness and the knavery of his servant, as this reason puts the sport of hawking itself out of his power, at least in its full perfection, so a tender, delicate, feeble constitution and a timorous, apprehensive, nice turn of mind will render him utterly incapable of enjoying it. Were it in his power, even in its highest excellence, if a person of this frame suffer a fit of keenness for the sports of the sky to hurry him through all their toils, he runs great danger of overfatiguing himself and thereby destroying his health. And if, on the other hand, his mind is occupied in the consideration of all the bad consequences which may arise from them, his fears exclude all enjoyment. While the sinewy sons of the field bound, light as deer, over every obstacle in the way of their diversion, the cautious valetudinarian picks his steps, calculating the probabilities of his death. If he strain his relaxed nerves to equal the jovial career of his fleet companions, the moment that the mountain's brow offers itself to his ascent, the fancy toil makes his lungs work in heaving pantings. Already, he thinks, his burst blood vessels are pouring out their purple contents at his mouth, and the dread of death almost puts a period to his life. The murmuring brook, which opposes itself to his progress, swells in his imagination to a roaring torrent, and grows more chillingly cold than the sharpest blast of the north. Straight his teeth chatter, his breast trembles throbbing, his flesh creeps on his bones, his voice seems hoarse, his blood is fevered, and to save his life he turns away from the hideous rill. When he arrives at the edge of the meadow, flooded with the rains of winter, the fight strikes him with horror. The echoing shouts of the company, whom he beholds with astonishment at their temerity, dashing fearlessly through it, in vain encourage him to follow. He fancies the quagmire under the water. His deluded eyes represent it rising and shrinking under their weight. Now he thinks himself up to the chin in the mud, just going to be swallowed. Now he labors for breath, oppressed by the terrors of imagined suffocation. In short, a man of slenderness and timidity ought never to think of hawking, but in very fine weather, and where he can take at his station at the summit of a dry hill, whence he may command a view of some miles around him, and see throughout the space whatever flights are made by the falcons. End of chapter 1 Chapter 2 The Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 Of the Implements of Falconry. Having given an idea of a skillful falconer, the implements of his profession come next under consideration. 
These are hoods, jesses, varvels, leashes, creances, lures, tubs, coping irons, gloves, blocks, and chamber perches of each in its order. The hood is a covering fitted easily to the hawk's head, neatly made of leather, enlivened with two circular bits of velvet, one on each side representing eyes, and rising up with a stalk about an inch in height, which is terminated in a small tuft of feathers. It is very ornamental to the bird, and the use of it is to darken her, that she may not bait from the fist, as she is apt to do when barefaced, and thus hurt her wings. Jesses are narrow straps of leather, five or six inches long, fastened to the hawk's legs, close to the feet, and when held by the falconer, serve to keep her steady on his fist. Varvels are small silver rings, bound to the end of the jesses, marked with his name who owns the hawk, and inform those who find her straying where she is to be sent back. The leashes are thongs about two feet long, inserted into the varvels, with buttons at the ends, to hinder them from running through altogether, and their use is to secure the hawk on the falconer's fist, by their being wound about his fingers, or to tie her up to her block. The creances are lines between twenty and thirty fathoms long, knit to the leashes. When you would prevent haggards that are, for the first time entered at game, from flying quite away, but used to entangle other hawks, in order that they may not carry off their quarry. The lure consists of leather, stuffed with feathers, resembling the body of a fowl, with the real wings of a drake or grouse, made fast to its sides, and flung on a thong. This delusion, whirled about the falconer's head, or thrown up into the air, imposes on the hawks, and brings them more readily within his reach than they would have otherwise come. The tub is a flat vessel, about four inches deep, which is set by the block where on the hawk sits, and filled with water for her boosing and bathing. The coping irons are a kind of pincers, with sharp edges, for paring the beaks, pounces, and talons of the hawk, when they are overgrown and so become incommodious to her. The glove worn by the falcon on the left hand is much larger and thicker than any other ordinary gloves and that in order to save his hand from being torn by the hawks as he feeds them or carries them in the field. The block is a solid piece of wood, shaped like a sugar loaf, with the six upper inches broken off, whereon the hawk perches, being tied to it by the leash, which goes through the last link of a small iron swivel fixed in its side. The chamber perch resembles one of the leaves of a folding screen. It consists of two pieces of wood, four feet high, joined together, at the top with a bar three feet long, and supported erect by a bit of wood nailed to each of the lower ends, in a contrary direction to the bar, which connects them above and covered over from top to bottom, with coarse canvas tacked to their sides. This frame stands in a dining room or in any other to which much company resort, and hawks being set on it become the sooner tame or manny pluming and dressing themselves by candlelight before the people who are by them. The leash is fashioned short around the upper bar on which the birds are perched, and the use of the canvas is to assist any one of them which happens to fall down to get up again to her place, by catching hold of the threads and turning herself up again. It is to be particularly observed that dog skin dressed with alum is preferable to every other kind of leather in the implements of falconry as it is known by experience to be tougher than any other, and so least apt to be torn by the hawks. End of chapter 2 Chapter 3 The Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Spaniels The small breed of Spaniels called King Charles are excellent for hawking, but because these dogs cannot hold out long in the ranging, on account of their diminutiveness, Others of somewhat a larger size are to be preferred. The Scottish and English Spaniels are strong enough to bear any fatigue, and in this respect have the advantage of the kinds I have just mentioned. But as they are too large to pass through the cover with ease and expedition of the former, they are, for this reason, less eligible. The management of the dogs in the field is easily understood. 
they must all be taught to stand still at the crack of a short whip which the falconer carries about with him for the purpose and to range through the cover at his accustomed whistle and call their obedience in the first case is absolutely necessary when the hawk's head is outward because she would miss any game they chance to spring when her fight was in a wrong direction they are therefore to stop till her head be inward again and whenever this happens are in the second case to obey directly the signals by which they are ordered to traverse the cover again that she may be observed as soon as possible good dogs make good hawks for it ruins a hawk to hover on her wings too long vainly waiting for her prey by not being instantly served besides the spaniels a setting dog is necessary whenever he makes a set the hawk is to be put to a high place above him and when you see her there and her head right in you are to run in and raise the birds before the dog in order to serve her this gives great advantage to a hawk on her being for the first time entered as it enables her to dart directly down on her prey whereby she hardly ever misses it and thus acquired new spirit and confidence in her attacks but if after all she should miss it the spaniels being for this end ready uncoupled are to be hunted into the cover immediately to retrieve or spring it again it is to be observed that high-flying hawks are not to be chased out of the hood from your fist because this management will soon make them forget going to their stately gait altogether the speedy rank-winged hawk is the proper one for chasing for she never goes to a high gait but depending on the force of her wings pursues her prey in its own track and seldom ever fails to kill it she is more bloody than the high flyer but this last affords pleasanter sport end of chapter three chapter four the treaty of modern falconry by james campbell this librivox recording is in the public domain of hawks and of the familiarity between them and the falconer and his dogs there is a great variety of hawks in the world but i propose to treat only those which the sportmen use in this island these are the falcon and tersal gentle the goshawk and the tersal the jeer falcon and jerkin the merlin and jack merlin the spar hawk and musket the laner and laneret the saker and sakeret before i proceed to the consideration of the hawks here enumerated let me recommend it to the falconer to cultivate a familiarity in his hawks with himself and his spaniels the way to bring about this familiarity is to be both himself and his dogs with them as constantly as possible the dogs ought always to be present when he feeds and exercises them they should be habituated to lie by them both when they are in their mew and on their blocks the benefit of this familiarity is that they will attend closely to the falconer and the dogs in the field and direct their own motions in the air by those they observe these make below i have seen hawks so familiar as to sit on a dog while he slept and plume and dress themselves in that situation also when the dog catches the partridge by surprise i have seen a hawk come down seize him by the head and take the fowl out of his mouth the dogs grow fond of the hawks and never resent any freedoms of this kind which they take with them it were of advantage to have the spaniels taught to fetch and carry for many partridges are killed by the dogs in the cover and lost for one of their being accustomed to bring their master the game they thus destroy end of chapter four chapter five the treaty of modern falconry by james campbell this librivox recording is in the public domain of the choosing of the falcon gentle this bird has received the epithet of gentle on account of her mildness and easiness to be reclaimed no hawk exceeds her in strength according to her size or is hardier to endure fatigue she is excellent to sport with at either field or brook it is an observation applicable to all hawks that they prove bold or cowardly according as they are first quarried or taught an error which some falconers have advanced comes to be confuted in this place they say that hawks taken from the airy before they are full summed and hard penned will have their wings imperfect at their best their legs crooked and their train long feathers and flags full of taints 
To this error I oppose experience on the contrary. For I have taken hawks from the airy, covered only with downs, which, by being fed with newly killed hot meat, drove their feathers, and were, when fully summed and hard, as strong and proved as good as any I've ever had from the airy full driven. In choosing hawks you will take notice that small falcons and large turtles are ever more of the best. The characters of a good hawk are a large black eye, a round head, wide nares, a short thick beak, a high neck, a round fleshy breast, broad shouldered, sails full side long, large thighs, strong arms, large feet, black pounces, long wings crossing the train, and a long train. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six: A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the names of hawks according to their different ages, falcons have different names according to their different ages, as Ias, Ramage Hawk, Soar Hawk, Mute Hawk, and Slender Hawk. All these hawks have different plumes and colors, according to the different countries where they are bred. Some, for instance, are dark and russet. They also differ in their dispositions, some being, for instance, better for the field and others for the river. As to their names, they are called Iases, while they continue in the Eyrie. Some falconers are against hawks from the Eyrie, because, say they, while they are young, they are troublesome in feeding and cry much, and when they are grown, it is difficult to enter them. This objection is of little weight for they will take new killed hot meat without any trouble and never cry if you feed them often enough with it by this management they become exceeding manny easy to be entered and when well quarried the best hawks for either the field or the river the ramage hawk is the name by which the ias is known after she leaves the eyrie and during the months of june july august hawks are of this age turn out excellent birds when properly reclaimed the sore hawk is a name which the ramage hawk passes by the months of september october and november the feathers with which she leaves the eyrie she keeps till the ensuing year when they are mewed they are called sore feathers the sore hawk changes this name at the end of november and receives that of carvest which she has known during the months of december january february march april and the half of May, being then carried on the fist. Some falconers represent hawks of this age as very great baiters, and therefore little eaters, as frequently troubled with philander worms, and are rarely brought to be good for anything. Experience confutes this opinion, by which it is certain that there is no other difference than age between them and those taken in the months of September and October. It is the falconer's fault if they bait, for he ought not to set them barefaced on their blocks, as, in that condition, irreclaimed hawks will bait in any month. As for the philander worms, the medicines to be afterwards mentioned will show they may be easily prevented or cured. Carvis, therefore, it is evident, may be rendered as good as any hawks, whatever, by proper care to reclaim them. The carvest in the middle of March begins to be called a mute hawk, or enter mew, which name she retains till the end of September. During this period she casts her feathers and gets a new coat. Some falconers object to her, that she is hardly to be trusted and must be on that account be kept hard under. They are right, if she was not entered the year proceeding. But if she killed plenty of game, then she is easily made manny from the mew and turns out to be the best of all hawks. A hawk which has not been entered at game the first year will never afterwards prove good for anything. End of chapter 6 Chapter 7 A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the proper method of hooding hawks which have an aversion to it from harsh usage. Hawks are apt to take an aversion to their hoods when they are forced on them roughly and unskillfully at first. The impatient falconer confirms their aversion 
by persisting in the same violent method whereby he first raised it, so that there is a contention between him and his hawk every time he is going to hood her, vexatious to his own mind and prejudicial to her health. In order to reconcile her to the hood, observe the following plain directions. When at any time, whatever, you carry her on your fist, hang on your little finger of the same hand a hood remarkable for the brightness of its color, that it may be the better catch her attention. Let it hinge there for a week, never permitting the hawk to see it during that period in your right hand, and accustom her to feed close by it. The next week you may venture to take the hood softly in your right hand and play it gently about her meat as she is feeding, now and then slightly touching her with it. This done, you will return it to your finger again where you hung it before in her sight, till you are ready to feed her. When you have brought her this way to endure it, you will move it easily on her meat, which you must hold on your left hand and seem as if you wanted to hinder her from eating. You will now observe that her aversion is decreased by her striving to keep it off and feed beside it. Then take a little bit of meat in your left hand and holding the hood by the tassel in the right just over it. Provoke her by the sight of the flesh to press it through the openings of the hood. When you have made her so familiar with the hood as to feed through it, without any signs of fear, you may augment this familiarity by drawing it over or shaking it about her meat yet more freely. As her aversion is now almost gone, you may bear the hood a little against her while she feeds through it. And you will find that in her eagerness to eat, she will thrust her head into it altogether and withdraw it of her own accord. When she hoods herself in this manner, let her eat freely till she has done with her food, and let the hood remain on her till you are next to feed her. By the following method you will in less than a month bring her to hood herself by the least bit of meat without any trouble. This course is tedious indeed, but it will ever again gain its end, whereas bobbing or struggling rends the hawk forever impatient of the hood. You will take notice that even this method will be ineffectual. If you begin it when the hawk's stomach is weak, because it is by the sharpness of her appetite that her dislike of the hood is to be overcome, all the gentleness and care is to be observed at first, to weaken her fears, and when she is once formed to your mind, she will with very little attention continue so. End of chapter 7. Chapter 8. The Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Falcon Gentle from the Eyrie. Having these forty years past kept hawks, I hope it will not be regarded as presumption to declare that hawks bred from the Eyrie are preferable to any whatever which are taken wild. It is with hawks as with all creatures. Those which are taken early from their dams into the care of man must become much more tractable and affectionate than such as are catched wild, which, after all our care to tame them, show a strong disposition to regain their former uncontrolled liberty. This is evidently the case with regard to all haggards, by which term is denoted all hawks taken by art from the sky in contradistinction to those that are reared from the eyrie. In order to obtain such a hawk as I am recommending, you are to visit the eyrie frequently the last week of May, that being the time when Iases begin to get their feathers. You are not to take them till you see their feathers almost driven and able to bear them from the nest, for if you carry them away in the down, they are in danger of contracting a disagreeable habit of shrieking, which is not easily broken. If May, however, be broken by very high feeding, which is also necessary at this time to raise them to their full strength and beauty. When you think the eyes is just far enough to be driven to be taken away, you are to put them in a broad basket and cover them with a cloth, that the darkness may hinder them from moving and breaking their feathers. But if they are too far driven to be caught with your hand, and branch from the eyrie to other parts of the rock, you are to let down a flag net before them, wherein they will be immediately entangled. When you see them fast, let the net drop down. If the bottom below them be safe, fall on. 
Otherwise, let them down as quickly as you can by the cord. I have several times catched them this way, even ten days after they had left the eyrie. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 The Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the treatment of young hawks when first taken from the eyrie. When you have got your hawks, you are to put them into the mew, which is a house designed chiefly for feeding hawks the second year, from March to September, at which time they get a new coat. While they are here, you are to visit them at least three times a day with hot new killed meat, such as hawks naturally prey on. The food they are fondest of is pigeons, small birds, rats, mice, hare, rooks, and chickens. For a falconer ought to imitate nature as nearly as he can in training them. You are to set small blocks in the mew for them to perch on, and to spread soft hay around the blocks, whereon they may rest on their breast in the night, as young hawks always do till their legs are strong enough to carry their weight. When you enter the mew with their food, present it to them hollowing at the same time. Ho, 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 as falconers do. And this hollowing are you to observe as often as you feed them. By pursuing this method for a few days, they will come to your fist on their own accord, and feed boldly, and in two or three weeks will follow you through the mew. When you see your hawks driven full length in their feathers, you are to have jesses, bewits, bells, and varvels in readiness, and to flip them softly on some darkish evening while they are feeding most eagerly, and not minding what you are about. You may then flip on their hoods also, but be sure they be easy and deep behind, that they may not pinch their heads, and made so as to draw close and easy below. For, if the hood was already observed, frighten or hurt them at first, they will take a dislike at it, which cannot be removed without much pains and trouble. You are therefore to carry them always on your fist in the day, frequently hooding and unhooding them by candlelight, and giving them a bit of meat when you pull off the hood, and flipping it on again while they are feeding. This treatment you must give them for several days, and as your hand will be their perch during that time, they will become quite tame and manny. End of chapter 9 Chapter 10 The Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the training of young hawks to the lure, now that your hawks come eagerly to your fist and feed on it fearlessly, you are to train them to the lure, which ought to be a German one, so large and heavy as that they will not be able to drag or carry it away. For these are among the worst faults that hawks can have. In order to prevent these faults, you are to feed your birds on your hand, or on the lure, or on the heck. And it is either in one or other of these three ways, only you are to feed them for the first year. Beware also never to throw them their meat as they are either flying or sitting on their blocks. Never to snatch their food hastily from them as they are feeding. Never to come upon them by surprise when they are on their quarry yourself or horses or dogs. It is during the first year they are aptest to contract the faults I am here putting you on your guard against. But to return to the luring of them, when they come readily to the lure in the mew and feed on it, and are well acquainted with and obedient to your voice, carry them out on a very calm day to the most extensive plain that lies near you. Take at the same time, along with you, a person who understands the hooding and unhooding of hawks, and having carried yours to the field, let him take his station about the middle of it, and slacken the hood of one of them. Then go yourself to the distance of a hundred yards from him, toss the lure around your head, and hollow with your usual tone, having previously ordered your companion to unhood the hawk as soon as he hears your voice. You will find that then the hawk will fly straight for the lure, which he must throw out to her, and, as this is the first time of her being lured in the field, you must have a piece of pigeon or chicken fixed to the lure, and that she may not be disappointed in her expectations. Next you are to lure at a still greater distance, which she must gradually increase till you go as far as to be just within her sight or hearing, and at all distances you will find her eager for the lure, 
This exercise you are to give her daily at nine o'clock in the forenoon and at four o'clock in the afternoon till you enter her at the polting, which begins on the twelfth day of August. And though she was brought from the eyrie only in the first week of June proceeding, you will find her grown even in a short time strong enough to kill any more fowl whatever. End of chapter 10. Eleven of a Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the way in which a red hawk is to be brought down or raised to proper plight. Care must be taken that your young hawk, which we now call red hawk, be in a middling plight, neither too low nor too high. For in the first case, she is too weak to fly with force, and in the second, will not take the trouble to obey the lure. When she is too low, you must raise her to her strength by high feeding, and when too high, and perhaps too hot, you will give her five or six small stones over the hand in the following manner. The hawk being on your left hand, you lay your left leg over the right knee, and setting the hawk's train over your left knee, which you do by extending your left hand, whereon she is sitting over the left knee, so that the part just above the wrist may rest on the knee. You are to have your pebbles and water ready by you. The hawk being in this position, you take between the thumb and middle finger of the right hand one of the pebbles, and pressing her beak on both sides with the forefinger and edge of the thumb, till she open it. You then put in the stone, and push it over immediately with the tip of the forefinger. This way of giving hawks pebbles is said to be over the hand, because you give them with the right hand over the left. But it answers best with an old experienced falconer. The safest way with the young hawk is to cast her. That is, you desire a person to take her in both hands by the shoulders and rest her breast on your knee. Then, while he holds her in that situation, you pull her legs by the dresses and leash so fast as to not strain them under your thigh, by which means she is fixed without any hurt. This done, you take the pebbles one by one out of the water and, pressing open her beak, make her swallow them. This is no sort of danger to the hawk this way, as she is secured from struggling by the hold which your assistant has of her above, and by the hold which the leash has of her below. But the overhand way may be injurious to her, if the falconer be not very dexterous in it. For when she is averse to the stones, she draws back her head as far as she can to avoid them, and by her violent motions runs much hazard of straining her back. These small stones or pebbles cool her, and at the same time separate from the panel whatever foulness may adhere to that vessel. Immediately after the stones, you are to give her casting, that is, the feathers and bones of small birds, or the pinion of the wing of any of the larger birds, or a hare's foot, beaten soft and washed with water, which must be afterwards squeezed out. If the hawk be in good health, she will take the casting out of your hand of her own accord, and you are to give her that not till after the meat is passed out of the gorge into the panel, which generally happens three hours after she is fed. If she throws up the casting early in the night and appear to be hot, which you will know by her eagerness for the bath, you will then give her the stones, which she throws next morning. If she need no stones, that is, if she be cool and properly inseamed, you will delay them till she is in a bad habit of body. It is to be observed that casting is absolutely necessary to preserve a hawk in health, and must therefore be given her always some hours after she is fed, at night in order to promote d digestion. But stones are never necessary but when she is hot, and are then to be given her after the casting. When she throws up the casting, which she does in the form of a ball, squeeze it, and you will learn by the yellow or clear color of the liquid which drops from it whether she is in ill or good health. By these rules and your own experience, you will be able to keep your hawk high and strong for flight, sharp and eager to wait on in the air. End of chapter 11
Chapter 12 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the proper times of feeding hawks, in order to have them ready for flying at any particular time after, there are great mistakes among falconers with regard to the proper time of the day when a hawk is in order for flying, but these may be easily removed. They arise from not attending to the time she was fed the day before, and may be prevented by carefully attending to that time. If you want your hawk to fly early next morning, you are to feed her moderately this evening, between three and four o'clock, and about seven, when her food will be gone into the panel, you are to give her casting, which will be thrown between four and five o'clock of the ensuing morning. If you want her to fly at midday, or the afternoon of the next day, you must feed her proportionably later. Thus you may know when she is in proper trim for flight, by knowing the time when you fed her last the day before. But to know this the more exactly, you must also take into consideration whether she was fed the light or heavy food, and calculate accordingly. End of chapter 12 Chapter 13 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the birds the hawk is to fly at and to avoid, when she is in training immediately for game. When you have made your hawk come with speed to the lure, by whistling her up to a place twice or thrice a day, then take a brown chicken, and, while she is flying about, waiting for the lure, throw up the chicken in her sight. The instant she observes the fowl, she will fly to, and seize it, and, for her encouragement, you must allow her to feed a gorge of it. By giving her in this manner a chicken two or three different times before you carry her to the field, she will fly at and kill the first poult you spring for her. Beware of giving her live pigeons, for that will make her check and fly at them ever after, whenever they come in her way. It is certain that, if she kill and feed upon a few of these birds when she is first entered, she will not take the trouble of flying at game, but will leave you in the field and go home to the pigeon house, where you may be always sure of finding her sue footed this practice will make her irreclaimable, and therefore you had best take off her jesses, bewits, and bells, as she is entirely useless for the purpose of diversion. And thus stripped, you may whistle her down the wind to prey on fortune. Footnote, Shakespeare, Othello. I never had two hawks that checked, which I prevented by never permitting them to kill a single pigeon, even when they flew at heck near a pigeon house and this I effected by the exact care and attention I paid to their feeding, which never having been neglected, saved them from the temptation to check. Flying in heck, as is to be expected presently, is so convenient and natural that no doubt but every falconer will prefer it where there is no pigeon house at all, or at a considerable distance. Some falconers enter their hawks with live pigeons at the lure, and from their hand, which is so absurd and obstructive in making a hawk and it ought not be mentioned. A red hawk inclines much to the bath, and needs it once in two days. I have already mentioned the tub in which she is to take it. The circumference of it must be wide enough to allow her to bathe with her wings quite open. If it be too narrow, she is in danger of beating her tender feathers on the edge of it, which I have seen happen. When this is the case, the blood or substance flies out of it, and the feather on the top of the pinion of the wing is by this accident lost, as it is in a situation which affords it little moisture. It will scarce ever come again after being once destroyed. End of chapter 13 Chapter 14 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the management of a hawk, when first entered at game, the falconer is now to go to the moors with his hawk, which I suppose is by this time well trained to the lure, and somewhat acquainted with blood, by the live chickens that were thrown her. Let him give her the bath the day before, and also her food and casting in the manner I have already directed, by which he will have her in exact trim for flying. Mark where one of the poults sits down, which you spring when you first enter the moors, and cause your setting dog set it. Then instantly unhood your hawk, set her face straight towards the dog, spring the bird, 
Let her go off your fist, and she will soon make it her own. When she has brought it down, go gently round her, while she is pluming the feathers off it, all the time hollowing her. Let her break upon the bird, and take the head and neck of it, and then lift her softly on your hand, and hood her as she is feeding. After she has killed two or three birds, feed her up on the last, for a good reward is great encouragement to a hawk. You are not to make her fly at all, fowls, till after she has killed three or four large poults, that she may not be disappointed by the superior strength and speed of the former, before she has fully acquired her own. A young red falcon or tercel, when in perfection, is the first year very bloody, for with such I have killed more fowls than any year thereafter. Further, if your hawk wait well on at her being first entered, hunt your setting dog and keep your hawking spaniels in couples. If the bird set by the dog after being sprung, take two cover, you are to uncouple the spaniels, to retrieve them, as it has already been observed in a former chapter. Great care must be taken to serve your hawk punctually, for many hawks for want of skillful falconers and good dogs have been baffled in their expectations, which, had they been kept in blood and quickly served, would have turned the best of hawks. A young hawk is able to fly two days as hard as you please, but every third you must give her weather and bath, and thus proceed during the sporting season. An intermute or old hawk cannot bear such fatigue, as she generally goes to a great gate. If you chase her, as you do a red hawk, it will bring her from her stately gate. Therefore, you are to fly them seldom in the day as you see them, in order to preserve their high flying and, at the same time, to carry your sport, fly on with your red hawks, which you cannot hurt if you keep them in blood. End of chapter 14 Chapter 15 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell This is a LibriVox recording. Of the superiority of the falcon from the eyrie over the haggard falcon. Notwithstanding the high estimation in which haggard falcons are held by some people, there are two objections to them, which, properly attended to, will very much diminish their value. First, they are naturally given to check, for, when they drive the game into cover, unless the falconer be very nimble to serve them, and be very careful to keep them low and high himself, they rake off with the first pigeons or crows that come in their way. This fault renders them useless. The second objection arises in some measure from the first, for, when they happen to be footed in the evening and cannot be found that night they are flown away before you come to the field the next morning in search of them being well acquainted with the country and able to live without human assistance these objections against haggard falcons as they are bred wild arise from the nature of the birds and are unanswerable but at the same time they show the superior advantage of hawks from the eyrie which are free from checking and will stay in the field where you lost them for a day or two, or, if they know the country, will go home to heck where you used to feed them. End of chapter 15 Chapter 16 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of flying at heck, let it be observed that the time for flying at heck is not when you fly your hawk at game every second or third day, but when you are resolved to intermit sporting for a week or longer. Immediately after you have entered your hawk at Morfowl, you are to accustom her to fly at heck. The properest place for flying at heck is an old turreted castle or other large building, where the hawk may have several places of shelter to perch or in stormy weather. The best spot for the heck is the bottom of a garret window on which you are to fix a board projecting two feet into the open air about the middle of this board two holes are to be made through which you are to put the ends of a small cord and then to append to them about two pounds weight of lead to pull them tightly down under the loop made by the cord on the surface of the board and between the two holes put the hawk's meat where it will be fixed while she feeds by the weight of a lead hanging below. By this simple contrivance, 
The hawk is hindered from flying off with her food, which would not only spoil it, but also teach her to carry, which would ruin her, if she learned to do it from the heck. If the house be low, and on that account unfit for a board in the window, nail the board on the top of a pole about ten feet long, which you will fix erect in the earth, as a heck for the hawk to feed on. The pole must be very strong, and firmly fixed in its place, as it must bear the weight of a ladder which the falconer ascends to put the hawk's meat on the board, but it is to be taken away immediately after, that boys may not disturb her as she feeds. But the garret window is much better for a heck than the pole, because by leaving it open, the hawk goes within and saves herself from bad weather. The red tersel, as he is a tame and manny bird, and neither so strong nor so ravenous as the falcon, is an excellent flyer heck, and not ready to check. Some falcons, in order to hinder their hawks from checking when they fly at heck, fill both the bells with lead. This is a bad method on two accounts. First, because it accustoms the hawk to fly low and hinders her from rising to a stately gait. And secondly, because it endangers the straining of her back, which, when it happens, destroys her altogether. The falconer must mark the time when the hawk is sharp, which is in the evening, is about four or five o'clock, and in the morning about six or seven, that he may feed her regularly. Her meat must be fresh and warm, for old or cold meat is contrary to her nature and will ruin her health. This is evident from the haggard which will never return to feed on the dead pelt of the bird she has killed and taken a gorge of, but must have hot blood for her next meal by killing another bird. If you cannot always command hot new killed meat, you must wash the cold meat in lukewarm water in winter and in cold water in the summer. This food will barely keep her in health, but never in that spirit and vigor which she receives from hot blood. But it is to be observed that, if you feed her long on washing meat, she will fall away, and is only to be recovered by changing her diet into warm, new-killed meat. I must, again, recommend it to the falconer to feed his hawk very regularly, for, if, by his neglect, she finds nothing on the heck on her return from her flight, nor see him ready to feed her, she will check hens, crows, pigeons, or any other bird to appease her hunger. Two or three neglects of this kind will ruin a hawk to her owner by giving her a propensity to check like the haggard. I used to feed my hawk so regularly at heck that she often sat on the top of the pigeon house among the pigeons without ever meddling with any of them. When the falconer leaves home, he is previously to take down his hawk and set her on a block in the garden under a shade, where in summer she may be sheltered from the heat and winter from the tempest. Here the dogs will lie and sleep by her, whither also they will come, if they by chance to lose you in a strange place. When the falconer returns, he is to feed his hawk high and set her to her wings. She will range then for some miles around, and on finding herself sharp set, return to the heck. I have kept hawks at heck the whole year, except cocking time, which continues the month of March and part of April. During this season, you are to take down your hawk from the heck, and to set her on a block in the garden in the daytime, with a tub and water and stones by her, and to put her in the mew at night. Lure her as often as the weather is good, but beware of wild haggards, for they will, in cocking time, Decoy your hawks away to the rocks, where they have their several eyries. I once had my tersel thus carried off by a haggard falcon in March, but recovered him on going to the eyrie. End of chapter 16 Chapter 17 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Advantages of Flying at Heck this way of flying at heck keeps your hawk in continual health and metal. And as you may feed her as high as you please, you may bring her to fly as hard as any haggard. It is, on these accounts, preferable to the old method of confining them, a method certainly contrary to their natural bent and disposition. It spoils her digestion 
engenders diseases, benumbs their joints, and robs them of their spirit and alacrity. By this means, the falconer, instead of deriving pleasure from his hawks, takes up his time in preparing drugs for their recovery. And before that is effectuated, the sporting season may be gone. But hawks that fly at heck are free from all these inconveniences, and not only equal but surpass haggards. For I have seen my hawk flying along with a wild one at the same partridge, and on coming up I always found the former sioux footed which is a proof she had outstripped her companion in flight. Nay, if you take from the haggard her exercise, her regular feeding, and confine her to a block or mew, she will soon lose her natural speed and strength, and fall far short of a hawk bred to fly at heck. It is observable that the falconers of former times were unacquainted with this way of making hawks, nor had they any occasion for it, as their sport was all chasing, not high-flying, which lasted the poulting and partridging season. And, when this was over, they threw their hawks into the mew, till it returned the ensuing year. They carried on their poulting in July with red hawks, and, when they could not make them fly hard enough by their confined way of keeping them, they unjustly gave them out as naturally worse than haggards. But the contrary opinion has been already established. The best sport, that of high flying, is at the woodcock from the beginning of november till the end of march when the cocking time is mostly over and about the middle of april set her to her wings end of chapter seventeen chapter eighteen of a treaty of modern falconry by james campbell this librivox recording is in the public domain of the proper food for hawks while they fly at heck and when they fly at game no flesh is better for a hawk than dog flesh when newly killed. With this food, feed your hawk two or three months in summer while she is flying at heck. It is easy of digestion, exceeding nutritive, and very efficacious to make the hawk drive her feathers. Give her as much as she pleases, for the violence of her exercise will enable her to digest it, and you will have her driven a month sooner than by any other sort of food whatever. But it is her great exercise which renders it so wholesome, because were she confined to a mule or a block without much flying, it is more probable that it would bring on diseases. As soon as her feathers are driven, you must leave off giving her dog flesh, and in order to prepare her for the moors or partridges, you are to give her stones and plumage and hot meat such as pigeons, small birds, hares, flesh, etc. The strength of a falcon, when in good order, is amazing. One day, when I was in the field, as my falcon was flying above the dogs, which were so busy seeking game, a hare started, which had been wounded before. The hawk perceiving her, came down, and by two strokes on the head, made her tumble over, and at the third, held her fast. She being now quite worn out, to encourage the hawk, I gave her the heart, with a full gorge of the hare, and ever after she flew at hares as at other game, killing them at two or three strokes, when they were clear of the cover. In this way a hare can hardly escape, especially if the dogs are in with them. End of chapter 18 Chapter 19 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of Birding Hawks Birding is a method of training hawks unknown to the falconers of former times. It is the best way of habituating your hawk to wait, jump on, and to go to a great gate. Nothing in the practice of falconry is more delightful, and at the same time more convenient, than to have your hawk in the sky waiting on you for a mile or two, till you have hunted all the fields and covers below her with your spaniels. It is highly entertaining to observe the rapid stoops she makes from her height as you spring her game. The falconer and his company mark them with looks and exclamations of admiration and delight. Larks only are proper for birding, on account of the great height to which they fly. To catch them, observe the following contrivance. Go to the field with a hawk on your fist, and carry along with you a boy with a flag net. 
As foon as you mark a lark, go round and round it, holding out your hawk, the fear of which will make it lie close. Then order your boy to throw the net over it, and with your assistance and take it up. In this way you may procure in summer as many larks as you please. But in winter, when they will not sit till you find them, you are to use a bag net. This net is about 18 or 20 fathoms long, and about 2 deep, with a small cord along the bar of it, about 3 or 4 fathom at each, and longer than the net. You are also to provide another cord longer than the net, and to tie to the middle of it, at small distances, 3 or 4 bunches of straw, which falconers call the baffle. These things prepared, you must set out at the dawn, or at the twilight, for at either of these times, larks fly not high, but skim along the ground. Observe where a lark sits down among the stubbles. Then two men, one at each end, hold the net loose at its length on the ground, and other two bear the cord with the baffle long, ever and anon wrapping it against the stubbles, toward those who take care of the net. As soon as they raise the lark by this motion, the bird sweeps along the ground towards the net. When the men at the net, who for the greater readiness, must be on their knees, see the lark within two or three yards of the net, and just about to fly over it, they bang it immediately up, and then let it fall, whereby the bird is taken. Thus I have seen ten or twelve larks taken, without missing one. You are to catch no more larks than will serve your hawk a single day two being sufficient for one hawk in the forenoon, and two in the afternoon. Four, when they are kept too long, they grow faint, and so cannot fly high enough. When you take them, put them into a bag with small holes to admit fresh air, and hang the bag in a dark place, that, by beating, they may not weaken themselves. Your larks being ready, take one of them out of the bag, and seal it. Sealing is performed in this manner. Pull out one of the train feathers, strip the plume off one side of it, and, and then put it through the one under eyelid over the beak, and lastly through the other under eyelid. Thus the plume of the other side of the feather, standing out under the eyes of the bird, hinders it from looking below, and as it can see only above, it will fly upwards, as high as it can reach, then whistle up your hawk, and when you see your head right in, throw up the sealed lark, which generally she will soon make her prey, and you must suffer her to eat it. But, when the lark gets straight up to its height, the hawk, by pursuing it, is also accustomed to go to a high gate. You may seal your lark so as she will have more light, and by that means render it more difficult for the hawk to overtake it, and at other times you may give her an unsealed lark, but if it outfly her, be sure to throw up a sealed one to her, that she may not be disappointed. This done every day before the partridging and cocking seasons, the hawk will learn to wait well on, and go to a great gate, particularly the tersel, which is naturally a high flyer, and does not carry. He should be trained more than the falcon by birding. End of chapter 19 Chapter 20 a Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of imping the hawk's feathers when broken. The feathers that are proper to be imped are the six large feathers from the top of the wing to the flag feathers. This first feather is called the sisal. The second, the long pen. The third, the cautel. After the fourth, fifth, and sixth follow the flags above the turn of the wing to the shoulder. These flags, as they are too small, cannot be imped, and therefore exact care must be taken to preserve them. But the trained feathers may be imped, and, to this purpose, you must have by you falcon and tersal wings and trains, or those of any other hawks you happen to keep. To remedy misfortunes of this sort, when they befall your hawk, you are to be provided with needles of the following shape. Take a bit of iron wire two inches in length, and with a file wear it down into a triangular form, sharpened at both ends. Then cut through, with a very sharp knife, the feather which is damaged in the place where you think it strongest. 
taking all care in the cutting of it, that you will take off none of the plumes on either side from the piece you leave in the wing or train of the hawk. This done, get a corresponding feather, and from it cut off a piece of the exact length of that which you have cut from the damaged feather, taking here the greatest care also that you cut off none of the plumes on either side of this piece. Next, thrust an inch of the needle into the part of the damaged feather which remains in the bird, and force on the other inch the piece which is to supply the place of that which was damaged, till both meet exactly together. Thus, in each part, there will be just an inch of the needle, and the feather will look as entire, and be as strong as if it had never been broken. The needle must not be too small, for fear the new piece might turn on it, nor too thick, lest it split both parts of the feather. And it must be wetted with salt and water that it may rust, and so hold both parts the better together. The falconer, if he is not accustomed to imping, will do well to practice it on some useless feathers before he try it on his hawk, lest his want of skill should spoil her. Imping, I know by experience, will restore the hawk to the use of her principal feathers, after being broken, and enable her to fly as well as ever she did before her mischance. There is another way of imping. When the feather is broken at the quill, or a needle is of no service. When this is the case, cut the quill nicely round, and fill it with a wooden pin, which will exactly fill it. But beware not to thrust it so far in, as to hurt the hawk, where the feather adheres to her flesh. Then take a corresponding feather, the quill of which is also nicely rounded, and put it on the other end of the pin, pressing it onwards till it meet the quill of the hawk. To fasten them the better, dip the pin, before you join the quills by it, in ising glass glue, and afterwards set your hawk in a dark place till the whole harden and grow firm. This way of imping, however, is less secure than that by the needle. Yet this trouble is worth the taking only when your hawk is remarkably good. Otherwise you will not need keeper to the following year, as you can have red hawks from the eyrie about the end of May. End of chapter 20「Chapter Twenty One of a Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain of the Haggard Falcon, having now treated at a considerable length of the falcon from the eyrie, I proceed to discourse of the same bird as taken wild from the sky. This hawk, reared by nature, is strong, spirited, and patient of every sort of weather. She ranges uncontrollable over sea and land and seizes for her habitation those places which best please her fancy. Such is her terror that the tersel, her natural companion, dares not to approach her but in the gentle season of love. And even then he is so overawed that he courts her favor by the timorous and winning marks of entire submission. There is no bird the object of her fear, and it is not till after frequent defeats that she declines the battle with those which are actually beyond her power. These excepted, the rest are her prey as they happen to fall in with her flight, particularly green plovers and pigeons, as they are greatest in plenty. She does not obtain her food but by hard flying, and this exercise, as it is wholly under her own regulation, is so far from being injurious to her that it preserves her in perfect health and vigor. Glut in her stomach, short wind, both caused by rest, or ill-managed exercise, and not so easily cured as prevented, are disordered she is unacquainted with in the wide range of the air. She is her own physician, not only in exercise, but also by feeding on the mustard seed and carlock she finds in the crops of the pigeons when they are her prey, and which are to her in the place of medicine. Thus she is ever more in strength, subject to hardly any other disease than old age, and in danger from no other quarter than the resentment of man. The way in which the haggard falcon managers herself is that we ought to follow, as nearly as we can in training her from the eyrie, or in treating her when she comes wild into our hands. I have already made the former part of this observation, in discoursing the falcon gentle, 
and fhall endeavour to illuftrate the remaining part of it in what I have to fay concerning the haggard falcon. Let me juft add, towards the further elucidation of what I have formerly said on this head, that, without frequent flights, it is impossible to have a good hawk. She grows useless by constant rest, and therefore it must be often interrupted by exercise. The falconer must have a perpetual eye on her, observing her flights, her suppers, her digestion, her casting, her muting, and slicing, whether often and drooping, which is dangerous, as by catching heat after her drawing while she is in her grease, or by some tedious flight flown before she is thoroughly cleaned, by receiving a great gorge after the same, which occasions the cray and slanders, which proceeds from the cold and dullness of the stomach, not kindly digesting what it receiveth. Now I go on to unfold the method of her reclaiming. End of chapter 21 Chapter 22 of a treaty of modern falconry by james campbell this librivox recording is in the public domain of the manner of reclaiming the haggard falcon haggards are taken by art fix a pigeon by a string on the ground which you know to be frequented by wild hawks and having spread your net near the pigeon conceal yourself out of sight a haggard perceiving the fowl will come south down on it and the moment you see her sue footed pull the net over her and take her up when you have got a haggard by this or any other stratagem, you will find her full of meat. Therefore your best way is to set her in a dark place in order to keep her from beating till she have emptied herself. Next morning, seal her. That is, stitch her eyelids, not quite close together, and carry her all day on your fist. Set her by you in the night, with a piece of twine tied to her foot, which you will pull now and then, to keep her from sleeping and at the same time call to her. When you discover by stroking her with a feather that she has left off starting, you are to accustom her to the ruster hood. This method of treating her when taken empty is the same with this now laid down, for she is on these occasions angry and fretful, and thereby subject to diseases. A feather is much better than your hand to stroke her with all, because it feels soft and gentle, and is therefore more agreeable to her. When she endures it easily, you are mildly and quickly to pull off and put on her hood at proper intervals of time. You are also gradually to slacken the ceiling and to hold this course till she takes the feeding. You are to give her meat often, but in small bits. The best time for feeding her is just before taking off her hood and just before putting it on in order to make it agreeable to her. All the while you are to use your voice to her and no longer than till she has done feeding that it may be a signal to her of your going to feed her. When you have brought her to endure the hood and feed with courage, you are to teach her to jump to your fist. Set her on a perch so high that you may be under her sight, because she will be afraid and beat if she see you above her, and then unstrike her hood and lure her with a bit of meat, using your voice at the same time, and she will fly directly to your hand. Then, while she feeds, you are to hood her, Proceed in this kind of way till you have rendered her familiar, and made her stomach perfect, above all things taking care not to disgust her at you. The stomach is the principle of her obedience, and therefore it ought to be carefully kept sound, right and sharp. Now you may venture to pull off her hood, and let her sit barefaced by you. If you then perceive her in any signs of impatience or uneasiness, in order to put her into good humor, offer her a bit of meat using your voice at the same time. This done, if she readily jump to your fist and take the meat, it is the proper time to accustom her to the lure. As soon as your hawk comes readily in the creance to the lure furnished with meat, it will then be proper to show her a live fowl at it. When she has killed the bird and eaten the head, take her gently up with a bit of meat, and while she is feeding, put on her hood, then lure her again to the dead pelt and do so two or three times only, for she will at last discover your purpose, and being unwilling to be deprived of her prey, she will learn to drag it from you. When you take her prey off in front of her, she will feel herself injured and begin to hate you. To lure her often at one time, and at first entrance, is the way to have her soon ready for game. But use the lure no oftener than I have directed. To use it oftener is more hurtful to a field hawk than to a river one, 
for the reafon now given that it renders her inclined to carry therefore after she comes willingly to the lure it is high time to lure her loose to lie fowls you must let her seize on them and kill them one after another even at your feet for six days together taking care to have her carried by a person who has skill to let her in with her head right towards you lure her to small distance till her stomach be perfect and herself very ready to answer for otherwise she may spy something else out of her way which she likes better and so check for that time which would much hurt her though she should be recovered again while she is on the ground pluming herself or feeding be sure you always walk around her using your voice and giving her bits with your hand continue to treat her in this manner all the time of her making till you have won her to lean and bend her body to your hand and to show herself at least willing to bring you whatever she has in her foot now it will be proper to spring her up from live fowl as she comes to you between your assistant and the lure and take care they be given in a long crayonce that she may not kill them far from you contrive it so that she may rake them over your head and fall near you for by this means she will be familiarized to your presence and do her business in it with courage but were she to see you while she is sitting coming at a great distance she would be ready through fear to stare at you and to drag or even to forsake her prey altogether for want of attention in this direction many hawks have been rendered useless having in this manner bestowed half a dozen fowls on your hawk you may in the evening suffer her to fly about you holding her with your voice and lure as near you as you can that she may pursue her game even over your head when she is in the air and her head right in throw her up a live fowl and when she has killed it be sure to reward her well and your generosity will hinder her from dragging or carrying evermore remember to draw in your hawk by the creance with great gentleness and to treat her so on every other occasion as the best way to gain her affection by this method she will be so far from dragging that she will meet you with the dead fowl on her accord satisfied with the peace she knows you are to give her end of chapter twenty two chapter twenty three of the treaty of modern falconry by james campbell this librivox recording is in the public domain of the ill qualities of hawks and how they are to be cured it is of great importance to understand the disposition of your hawk in order to train her up with success there are some hawks which after your utmost pains to breed them properly will abandon you the moment they are at liberty your black and swarthy plumed hawks have most commonly this untractable temper they are indeed birds of metal and high flight but impatient of control and difficult to be brought under subjection to reclaim your hawk from this wandering disposition you are to abate her pride with washing meat and casting paying always a proper regard to the nature of the weather it is to be soft and mild you can do her no hurt by keeping her pretty low till she amend her bad manners and then you are to raise her gradually to her proper pitch but if the weather be cold and violent you must beware of bringing down her flesh too quickly and of keeping it too long down this done take a staunch make hawk and in the evening throw up a fowl to her when you have sent her to the air after she has stooped once or twice and is just about to kill it stand under the wind with your hawk let her see the fowl struck and go to the quarry if she fly in with impetuosity and sees the fowl with courage in this case you are to cross the wings of the fowl to hinder it from beating against your hawk and suffer both her and the make hawk to feed a few minutes together on it then with clean meat gently take your make hawk and leave the quarry to the other that she may take her pleasure on it but beware she take no pile or pelf which would glut her but reward her with clean meat as she sits on the fowl and thus treat her three or four times this kind of hawk is only proper for waterfowl and if the next time you carry her to the brook she fought eagerly with the make hawk at her prey you may hope well of her for this sport 
But, if you fly away after all your pains in this way, you are to consider her as irreclaimable. There is another sort of hawks which are of a mild disposition, easily managed and brought to your wishes in making them. String up a couple of fowls, throw off your make hawk at them, and, after she has stooped once, or is just going to do so, let in your other hawk. If she look keenly on the make hawk, and contend in flight with her, let her fly on till she has almost overtaken her. Then show her the fowl, if you did not do so before, and let her still contend for it with her antagonist. And so much the better if they kill it at the next down come. This will give your young hawk great heart, and make her fly with more eagerness another time. A hawk ought to be always served, if possible, before she grow weary, for much fatigue is apt to disgust her, even when successful. There is a third sort of hawks which are made without much trouble, but are, on trial, found to be of inspiring temper, which is apt to spurn at obedience. To a hawk of this character, little liberty is to be allowed while you are making her. She must not be indulged in either very high or very extensive flights, but be kept as close by you as possible. For otherwise, when she comes to be well blooded on fowl, you never can command her flights, nor will she mind the make hawk, but look for her prey in her own way, as if she were wild. If you would therefore gain her affection, you must show her some gain very speedily, else she will seek it for herself, regardless of your attention. There is a fourth sort of hawks, which are fair plumed, that are very bold and spirited, and when skillfully reclaimed, have much attachment. One of these, let in with other hawks, will be reclaimed with two or three quarries. But, if you have no other hawks, greater trouble is requisite to make them by themselves. In this case, they must be strong, and their stomachs eager to urge them on. Choose at your hour of a fine evening, when all check is past, and know also of a couple of small fowls in a brook, where you may not be perceived by them. Large waters and many strong fowls give much fatigue to a young hawk. Then throw off your hawk as near them as you can conveniently, that she may be but a short while on the wing before they spy them. If she fly hard and close, she will bring down one of them at the second stoop. For the impetuosity of a hawk terrifies her prey, and brings it the sooner into her power. But if she fail, have in your pocket a fowl ready to throw up to her before she have tired herself too much in pursuit of the one you sprung to her from the brook, that she will easily overtake, and it will serve to put her into spirit after her fruitless chase. Continue to treat her in this way, while she flies solitarily, and she will soon come to your mind. For nothing so much hurts a young hawk's keenness as many toils and stoops to no purpose. End of chapter 23 Chapter 24 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of Bathing and Weathering Hawks. Hawks that are perfectly sound seldom show any inclination for the bath. But when disease heightens the natural heat of their constitution, they are very desirous of it. Hawks which flies at waterfowl is so often wetted in chance of her prey that she needs no other bathing than she receives on these occasions. But water ought to be set by other hawks. And, and when they bathe, let them dry themselves in the air, if the weather is temperate. But if it is cold, it is necessary to dry her at such a distance from the fire, as will bring the heat of it nearest to the mild warmth of the sunny air. Then set her on a perch where the cold cannot reach her, and let her come no more abroad that day or night. Too hot a fire would over-dry her feathers, and also overheat her body. Two bad effects which are carelessly to be avoided. Whereas the haggard is reared by her dam in the open air on the tops of high mountains, and afterwards exposed to all sorts of weather, therefore you must fall in somewhat with her nature in this respect. The evening and the morning are the proper seasons for giving her the weather or the air, and then before she is fed. You are also to weather her in her hood, in which she will sit quiet and peaceable. But when she is barefaced, she will be in struggle, to the great danger of hurting herself, as well as relapsing into her natural wildness. After she has been sufficiently weathered, 
you are to feed her with clean meat on your fift and then hood her as before. End of chapter twenty four. Chapter twenty five of a Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the times when haggards are to be taken into the mew, and how to prepare them for it. About the first of March, haggards leave their countries abroad, where they had spent the winter, prompted by nature to return to their eyries for the deed of generation. This is the time when old haggards are to be set down in the mew, and must be fed high to preserve them from languishing under confinement, as also to raise them to their natural violence of their kind. Intermediate haggards, being stronger to resist the inclements of nature, may be flown to about the middle of March, and are then to be set down. The passenger sore falcons, being young and more delicate and tender than the rest, and must therefore be better fed than the other mean hawks, they are impatient of confinement but with proper management may be made excellent hawks, and flown a month longer than the others. The first of April is the time when they are to be set down in the mew. When you prepare your hawk for the mew, you must raise her flesh gently, never giving or suffering her to take great gorges, for fear of surfeits. While she flew, this caution was less necessary, because her exercise enabled her to digest her plentiful diet, and your care to give her stones kept her stomach free of glut to harm her. But as your intent is now only to raise her flesh, to prepare her for the mew, to give her the same quantity of food you used to give her, without the same exercise to digest it, will overload her stomach, and, instead of fatness, will fill her with distempers. Now if you have kept her clean during the flying season, you may set her down on two meals a day, of hot and bloody meat, proportioned exactly to her power of digestion. When in a week or two you perceive her mended, you are to feed her only once a day, and then, if you give her young pigeons flesh, so much the better, but be sure to pluck out the feathers for fear of check. If that flesh is not to be had, you must give her such other stronger food as you have, but in smaller quantity, according to its strength. By this preparation, your hawk will be soon in health and flesh for the mew, but without it, is an eminent hazard of perishing by indigestion. End of chapter 25 Chapter 26 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of putting your hawk into the mews and of her treatment there. Before you put your hawk into the mew, clean her from all sorts of vermin, such as mites and mice, but she may happen to be troubled, and will hinder her from thriving in the mew. Take off her old dresses and give her a pair of new ones, which may be strong enough to last till you set her down again. For to put them on when you draw her would make her struggle, and thus perhaps run her grease. Keep the mews sweet and clean with air and sweeping, and often examine your hawk's casting and mutes to discover the state of her health. Let her always have plenty of fresh and clean water by her, and also of pebbles and gravel, that she may take in her uneasiness the remedies to which her nature directs her. Clean the meat you shoot for her from the black and bruised flesh, which is spoiled by the lead and gunpowder, for it is far from being wholesome. The greatest cleanliness is to be observed in everything about her. It is extremely conducive to her health. End of chapter 26 Chapter 27 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. How the hawk is to be taken from the mew. When you take your hawk from the mew, you must take care to set her on a perch, with as little beating or struggling as possible, to prevent her from throwing herself into a heat. Set her where she may see and hear people with, without being disturbed or exasperated by them. Then take care very softly on your fist. Carry her lightly up and down and stroke her gently with a feather. When she grows impatient and restless, Set her down directly on her perch, and proceed in this mild way till she admit of the greater familiarities. But above all things, take care to keep her quiet. To reclaim it and seem a hawk from the mew, require the highest care and attention, on account of her fatness, and whatever overheats her, does for that reason endanger her life. 
when you by your patient and foft ufage you have brought her to eat, you are to feed her twice a day with new meat, clean from the blood in fair water, allowing her just as much and no more than she can easily digest. For the first week or ten days give her neither casting nor stone, but after that term give her every night half a dozen of stones after she has discharged her supper from her gorge into the panel, and these will cast very early next morning. The third week you may begin to give her every night a casket, gradually augmenting the quantity of her meals, and not washing her food quite so hard as at first, paying always a suitable regard to the strength of her stomach. This regimen you are to observe till and during the crying season. Stones and casting are not to be given her the first week, because she is then unruly and full of grease, and, were she to be ever so little heated in this condition, she would probably never cast them, and so perish. The second week she has become less unruly, and has discharged some of her fat, and therefore is able to receive and cast stones. The third week her stomach has recovered its proper order, and consequently she will cheerfully take her casting every night. At this time, you shall not find by her casting or mutes much grease come from her, nor yet observe that she reclaims and seems according to your expectations. But there is still grease in her, though, for want of exercise, it does not appear, and therefore you must begin to lure her, and give her the benefits of her wings, at first in short and easy flights, which are to be by degrees lengthened, according as her health increases. Give her no stones in the day, because then they hinder her from taking food with safety. But at night, when they are very powerful in removing the glut and ill humors of the hawk. When you give her casting of flannel or cotton, take care to have them washing as clean as they can be. For, when they are nasty, the filth in either disorders the stomach of the hawk, and makes her sometimes cast it up next morning all black and tawny, with her meat undigested. The best time to give this sort of casting is when the hawk is in seen, and foul in her grease. For then, her disordered stomach is less apt to be affected by it than when she is in a state of pure health. Even when she is in her grease, it sometimes forces her to cast in the morning before her time, when her supper is not yet perfectly digested. When this happens, her casting is unwrapped of a tawny color and filled with muddy water, on which account flannel or cotton ought to be given only on light suppers with some plumage, but never on a great gorge. When, in a morning, she makes a loose, unwrapped casting of plumage, give her a little knot with stones, and bring away straggling feathers out of the panel. From the casting you may learn the state of your hawk's body. If the casting looks black and scorched, she is hot and dry. Give her then no more flannel or cotton, but the plumage instead of it. If, from the casting, instead of clear water, which is a sign of health, you squeeze a roping froth, this is a sign of great heat and drought, which, however, is the least to be feared if the casting be wrapped. This is most commonly the case with hawks which are flown before they be thoroughly cleaned, but they may be cured by easy gorges of good meat, with very pure water along with it, during a week, without any casting, but half a dozen of stones, with the stump of a wing, every night after she has put away her supper. In this course, do not restore her health in a week. Continue it till it has a desired effect, and then cease to give your hawk any more woolen casting as it appears unnatural to her. Further, with respect to the giving of stones, it is best to give them at night to haggards and ramage hawks, because these birds will not be so well reclaimed in a short time, but that they will have pride and a stirring humor in them, especially in the morning after their night rest. To remove these elements, it is proper you set them in a dark place and give them stones at night. For then your hawks, being quiet, do not stir, beat, or strain their bodies while they are loaded with them. I know by experience, contrary to the opinion of some, that the stones will not overheat her when she is in this condition. When you have brought your hawk to perfect health and flying, Neglect not to give her stones after strong food to purge away the ill humors that will be bred by it in her stomach. If you imagine her greatly after a long flight, 
Give her lyre ftones after a light fupper. Let her plume herfelf, and fet her up warm. Upon the whole, you ought never to fly your hawk from the mew, till by gentle treatment you have reclaimed her, and by tender food and moderate exercise you have thoroughly cleansed her. End of chapter 27 Chapter 28 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. How it may be known whether a hawk be properly in -seen. When your hawk is much inclined to bowsing, this is a sign that her body is too hot. If this heat arises from foulness and grease remaining in her after she has been flown, her mouth and throat will appear whitish, her breath smell disagreeably, and her mutes will have the bluish color of stale, skimmed milk. If, from too great haste to have your hawk in flying order, you bring her quickly down by scouring and medicines, you will, instead of enseaming her, reduce her to a state of feebleness, wherein she will be useless. The art and skill of the falconer is to keep his hawk high of body, when she is scoured and inseen, that she may be able to fly with force. And if he cannot keep his hawk in this condition, he is no falconer. In this case you will observe her mutes mingled with a kind of curdled matter, of a white color, which shows her not only afflicted with heat, but also sometimes of the cray. Hawks of this kind contained and produce within them a kind of watery slime, which, while it is in moderate quantity, is necessary to their health, but hurtful when redundant. Plumage is the natural cure of this redundancy. It very often happens that the hawk appears to the eye thoroughly in seen, when she is not in that condition. Nothing is found in her mute so casting which look like greasiness, and hence a hasty falconer concludes she is in fine order. But this only proves her panel is clean, and this part is generally cleansed by casting stones and good meat before the rest of the body, which, after all these means, is still foul. If the hawk be heated in this situation, her life is still greatly endangered, and therefore time and gentle exercise must be taken to inseam her body after the panel is put into order. Too much taste is here to be avoided, for a hawk drawn from the mew cannot be well prepared for a flight in less than the space of four weeks. Hawks which are sooner flown at game may indeed escape with life after being overheated, but their life is thenceforth good for nothing. After their death, you will discover, on opening them, that they have perished by being overheated for you will see their grease sticking of a blue color to their sides, and run in hard lumps. Upon the whole, whatever appearances of your health your hawk may exhibit after stone and casting, you are not to consider her as really inseen till she is set to her wings, and exercised gradually from easy to long flights. Then will she break grease, and be prepared to your mind throughout the whole body. End of chapter 28 Chapter 29 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Merlin and Hobby. The Merlin and Hobby are nearly of the same size and disposition. The former builds her nest in heat, and the latter on a tree. The Merlin, the diminutive of the falcon, is capable of being made exceedingly manny and tame. She is best when bred from the iron. She will kill partridges but excels every hawk at larks and snipes. She will fly at heck all the year round, except two months when she is taken down to the mew at cocking time. Her weakness is her chief defect, which hinders her from keeping the fist in windy weather. She is to be trained in every respect like the falcon. You may fly her in the forenoon till ten o'clock, give her rest in the heat of the day, and from two o'clock you may fly her till sunset. If you diet her properly, there is no hawk able to give better sport. You may enter her at quail, but she gives exquisite pleasure at the lark, mounting to a very high place, if yet an eyes. In a plain country, she will drive the lark so fast in the air, both making the one stoops and the other buckles for a long time, and if the lark get down, she darts into the door or window of a house for safety but never takes to a thicket or bush. 
she being a long winged bird, and always sits on the open ground. As to the hobby, just before this bird is able to perch on the side of her nest, take her away to another you have provided for her on a tree in a garden, where she may be out of harm. There, feed her with bits from the point of a stick, sharpened for this purpose, till she is able to stand firmly on her legs and pull hard at her meat. This artificial nest is not to be above the reach of a man. Then begin to lure her thence by your voice to your fist, and a single foot is enough at first. As she increases in strength, you are to increase the distance. But till she obey your voice from as far as she is able to hear it, and wait on you in the air wherever you would have her. When she is fully summed, dress her in jesses, bewits, and bells, and accustom her to the hood and fist by gentle usage. Then train her with larks, never giving her any from the hand or fist, but allowing her to kill two or three on the lure. Afterwards, tie one of them to a creance of brown thread, and let her fly at it, after it has got to the height of a tall tree. When she has killed two or three this way, she will go eagerly to her business, affording immense diversion to the spectators. Being thus thoroughly trained, you may permit her to fly at head continually at those times you have no use for her. But take care that, for some days before, you lure her by your voice from about a quarter of a mile, and there feed and leave her. When she is fed, she will directly return to the place where she was trained up at first, that is, to her heck. On resting days, after her gorge, she will soar at noon out of sight, and by these high flights will gain as thoroughly a knowledge of the country as any haggard. There is, on this account, no danger of her being lost when she remains behind you, sue footed within four or five miles of your residence. For, after she has finished her meal, she will return to her heck, and in this course she is to continue till the cocking season, that is, till the first of March, when she is taken down for two months. End of chapter 29 Chapter 30 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Jeer Falcon. The Jeer Falcon is the bird of passage, her eyrie being in Moscovy, Norway, and Prussia. She is of a fierce and fiery nature, very hardily managed and reclaimed, but being once overcome, proves an excellent hawk, scarce refusing to strike at anything. She does not naturally fly by the river, but at heron and other big game. In going up to her gate, she does not hold the course or way that other hawks do, but climbs up upon her train. When she finds any fowl, as soon as she has reached her, pulls her down, if not at first, yet at the second or third encounter. You train this bird just as you would the falcon. You must make her very gentle, both at home and abroad, before you enter her at game. After you have gained this point, you are to teach her to come to the dead pelt of hen fowl, heron, or any other flesh of the same kind. For, being dead, it will not overheat her, nor tempt her to thirst at herself. You must allow her to touch none of the flesh, except from your hand. All the while she is pluming, cheer her with your voice as you go about her, and sit by her on your knees. By this means she will look for her food from your hand only, never minding that she has in her foot and be entirely reclaimed from carrying. The jeer falcon flies with great spirit at heron, but always take care to give her the due reward the moment she brings down the fowl. This shows the necessity of training a hawk well at first, for if she be well made at the beginning, she is everlastingly made. Before you spring any fowls, let her kill half a dozen at the lure, close by you, having a pair of short cleances at it, to prevent her from carrying. For when she sees the fowl fluttering, she is apt to come down rapidly in order to rake it off, but the creance is into her, and so the neither crosses your design, nor is it put into a pet by your opposition. When she has the fowl, go gently in to her, give her nice bits of meat, and she will leave it untouched to come to your fist. This method, diligently observed, will effectually reclaim the haggard jeer falcon to fly well and kill fowl, 
but efpecially to purfue the hare. This is the game at which they give the beft diverfion, by the ftatelinefs of their flight. And intermute birds are the moft proper for it. These, as they are not yet habituated to any particular sort of prey, may be easily reclaimed by the following course. First, you are to consider that gyrophons newly taken from the air are full fed, and therefore you are not to suddenly change their natural way of living, giving them neither too hard food nor labor till they are new. Hawks in good plight will not only fly at game which they see cannot be easily come at, but wait, wait for a better opportunity. This is the case with old hawks, but young unexperienced birds will fly at any disadvantage. This caution of old hawks robs the falcon of the sport, but to make them more eager, he needs only to lessen the quantity of their food, and then will fly boldly at every thing he springs to them. Yet this diminution must be made with prudence, for fear of weakening the hawks. The flight at heron depends entirely on the eye and force of the hawk, and can receive no hindrance or encouragement from the falconer, who has only to view and admire her motions. It may be just observed that no hawk is so liable as the girafuck to perish by being overheated. And, secondly, if your hawk be a fresh haggard, or newly such, she will be the better able to endure fatigue. But you are carefully to study whether her taste be already formed to another game than you would fly at her. Should this be the case, you are to use all your art to break off all her natural habits and to make her take on those which, which are most agreeable to your own will. After the season of making and flying is over, your hawk is to be gradually filled up to full flesh, and mewed with all care. As the jir falcon is a heavy bird, green sods, often shifted, are the best perch for her, for their moistness and softness save her feet from being hurt by her own weight. Set water and stones by her, and give her the whole range of the mew to move in and she will manage herself better than any person can do. When you take her again from the mew, you are to have fair, jolly, capacious ruster hoods, through which you can give her plumage, bones, or stones to purge her, and also washed meat. There is much danger in infeeding her, and therefore this operation should be gradually performed. The shortest space wherein a jeer falcon can be made, ready for the lure from the mew, is six weeks. Her life is in danger if she receives the least heat in her grease. If all due care is taken of her, she will continue good for twenty years. She is indeed excellent as the heron or kite, but if you want to train her to the river, you are referred to the directions given on this subject with regard to the haggard falcon. End of chapter 3031. Of a Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Goshawk. The Goshawk is found in the north of both Scotland and Ireland, where she builds her nest in a tree. Her nature is hot, and constitution is stronger than that of any other hawk. She kills at the bout. Being short winged, she is not to be flown at heck. No hawk is more ravenous, nor more forgetful of her keeper if she happened to get a day or two out of his sight. She is never liable to the crock, philanders, and liver shot, infirmities which all other hawks are subject to. When you get a goshawk from the cage, she is generally much hurt by carriage and improper food, and therefore needs cleansing previous to your beginning to reclaim her, which you may give her, without medicines or scouring. You must procure her a good stomach before you give her casting and this you will effect by good meat, clean washed and dressed, given in gorges suited to her digestion. To accustom her to the hood, slip it easily on while she is feeding, and at moderate intervals take it off, to give her little bits, and ever steal it gently on while she swallows them. About an hour, or little more, after supper, give her a casting, and she will throw it up in the morning, and after a few days of this care, she will take it herself. Give her not a bit of meat soon above her casting, for this endangers her life by choking, and at least never misses 
of making her sick. When she is well and seen, and in actual flying, give her plumage every night immediately after she is fed up. But when she rests, very clean meat is all that she needs till the morning, when you are to give her prepared hare's foot. Woolen casting is improper. After a plentiful supper, it fatigues her stomach and hinders her digestion, and thus comes up before the natural time. If you examine it, then, it is of an adult color, clammy in its texture, and sometimes mixed with dirty bloody water. It has been known to grow into solid hard ball, called a coulion, which she is not able to throw up, and so kills her. Something further concerns this shall be mentioned hereafter. The food proper for her during the flying season is good meat well washed, and afterwards squeezed in a clean towel, till the water run all out, except she is sick and weak. Yet if she is very hard flown and much fatigued, you must give her thrice a week the neck of a partridge or woodcock to supper. Warm in the blood, but when she is set to rest, let her meat be very well washed and hard squeezed, and dried a little, in order to keep her stomach sharp and her temper obedient. If the weather is severe, the hawk is apt to grow benumbed and dispirited, and therefore you must not fly her with an empty stomach, but every now and then give her bits to support her strength and courage during her flights. She is also subject to flatulencies, which appear by the swelling of the gorge and her croaking, and these, as well as lowness of flesh, are remedied by diet suited to the weather, to her labor, and to her digestion. If these flatulencies are not guarded against, they bring on the cray and other infirmities. And if her flesh falls low, it is very difficult to raise it again in the cold season. Proportion her diet while she is hunting to the length or shortness of her toil, and yet so that her appetite may be sharp and her strength sufficient for flight. There is a considerable difference between old and new killed meat. The former has lost its nourishing qualities, which no washing can ever restore it. And instead of strengthening your hawk, it reduces her to leanness and many other diseases. Hot meat, on the contrary, though washed and squeezed, still retains enough of nutriment and promotes health and prevents disorders. Take all pains to gain the love and familiarity of your hawk, and for this purpose, Never take her up on your fist without whistling and using your voice, and giving her a stump or bit of meat to please her. But harshness will disgust her and make her hate you, for she cannot bear to be opposed stubbornly or contradicted. You must also observe to her to give her dinner while you are unseeming her, not all at once, but in small bits at several intervals. To give it all at once will retard her making, but to distribute it will accelerate her making. End of chapter 31 Chapter 32 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To reclaim the goshawk taken from the cage To reclaim the goshawk from the cage, observe the following directions. Give her a fortnight's carriage or more in her rougher hood, always stroking and soothing her with a feather till she bear your hand Feed her with clean washed meat, and keep her by you on a perch in the night time, ever chirping and whistling to her, in order to prevent her from sleeping. Thus you will put her stomach in good order, and render her obedient to your will. Then you may take off her rust or hood, and put on another of the ordinary sort, which fits her easily and neatly. To accustom her to this hood, give her a bit of meat every time you put it on, and in a short time she will make no resistance. Then set her on a high warm perch in a dark place for cold gifts or cramps to sleep two or three hours. Afterwards, lure her with a bit of meat as also with your voice to your fist and dividing her meal into several parts. Feed her at proper intervals with it while her hood is on. Follow the same practice in the daytime as the best method to make her fond of her hood. If she is very shy, do not meddle with her but by candlelight and at meals. Last of all, you are to teach her to jump to your fist, which she will do readily. If her stomach is in good order, and you show her a bit of meat, this you can do when you are feeding her with the bits into which her meal is divided, and you may bring her 
with thefe from twenty or forty yards diftance from you for a fortnight. In that time fhe will become quite bold and familiar, and be for ever hindered from carrying. If fhe happen to be brought too low, fhe will never after enjoy her health. Now that you have brought your hawk to this pitch of perfection, you muft further breed her to be familiar with your spaniels. At her meals, draw the dogs together, and, stooping, feed your hawk on your fist among them. You are then to have three or four couples about you, to prevent her learning to know the particular one you take to the field with her. At the same time, have in a short creance the dead pelt of a pullet or hen, which you are to throw among them, that she may fly from your fist and chop among them and seize it. Suffer her to plume a while on it, and then take her up again with a stump to your fist, and then throw the pelt as before, encouraging her to fly after it. Continue this course daily till you find her venturing fiercely among them, and you will soon perceive her intimidating the dogs, who will immediately give way as soon as they see her coming among them. Without all this preparation, she would have been of no use to you. End of chapter 32 Chapter 33 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of entering the goshawk, when you carry your hawk to the field for the first time, beware of her flying near dove coats or farmhouses, lest she should check at pigeons or poultry, a fault from which she is hardly or ever to be reclaimed. To enter her at game, take with you three or four live partridges. Send your servant with one of them to the cover which she shall beat with a pole, as if he were springing fowls, calling at the same time to the dogs, and let him slip away his partridge dexterously when he sees the hawk's head right in, hallowing to her to raise her attention to it. When she has killed it, run in and take care that neither the dogs nor anything else may frighten her from her prey, but let her plume it and take blood, having the spaniels all the while by her. After she has eaten the head, which you are to teach her to dispatch on the ground in her foot. Throw the dead pelt of the partridge among the dogs and let her take it in her short creance, that she may not carry it from you. While she sits on it pluming, give her her supper. By a few lessons of this sort, she will come to distinguish a partridge at first sight and fly readily at it. But you must not for the first year allow her to see pheasants at all for fear of putting her out of conceit with partridges. In the beginning of the season, take care not to fly her at the young partridges, till they be at the distance of two or three hundred yards from you, to prevent her killing them too suddenly, and without any trouble. Besides, the partridges grow daily stronger towards winter, and therefore, if you allow her to kill them at your foot at first, she will not pursue them when in winter they are able to fly with the utmost force. She will turn from them as soon as they get a few yards before her beyond the usual distance, and, from despair of overtaking them, will take her station on a tree. It is a fault to which this hawk is subject, that she sits still on the ground, instead of waiting on in the air, after she has driven the partridge into the cover. Hence it happens that she never sees the partridge after the dogs have retrieved it, and so it is lost. To amend this fault, Take her up by both her shoulders in both your hands and throw her quickly on the nearest tree or hedge. This done, call your dogs and spring the partridge under her eye or as near as you can. She will then fly at it and give you far more sport than you could have had by killing it just before her in the cover. Continue this practice and the fear of being tossed up joined to the hopes of the game will soon induce her to get on high of her own accord. This is the fault of a young hawk, and you are never to lure her to your fist before she has killed the fowl. Beware of carrying her barefaced, for the light making her beat and hail on your hand tends to weaken her for flight and render her averse to her hood. No hawk demands the hood so much as the goshawk, which she ought never to want but at weather and bath. End of chapter 33 Chapter 34 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of entering the goth hawk at the cover. If you would make your hawk bolt to fly at pheasants in thick woods, as she was in open fields, spring a fowl to her, 
and fend her at it. When you fee fhe has brought it down, command your dogs behind you, lest they run in and rob her, and go you in search of her. But if she miss it, take her on your first, or put her on a tree, and spring it again as near her as may be. And if she has killed it, keep your dogs behind, and suffer her to plume it a while. Then walk to her, rustling yourself and dogs through the bushes, and stooping, give her the head and neck and her foot for her recompense. When she has done, throw the body of the pheasant among the dogs, and send her after it, that she may snatch it from them. Make ready her supper, and give her that instead of the pheasant, which you are to steal dexterously from her while she is busy with the other. The reason why you are to keep the dogs behind you is, besides the danger of their robbing the hawk, to hinder them from disturbing and frightening her at the prey. This is the course you are to take with the goth hawk in flying her at pheasants, and that you may take it still more successfully. Attend to the following preparation which ought to have stood at the beginning of the chapter. The pheasants sometimes, instead of flying directly on, take the perch, whence the hawk is to be taught to take them. For this purpose, take a brown chicken with you to the wood in the evening, and having broke its neck, erect it at the top of a long pole, high enough to be seen by the hawk. Then stirring the pole so as to give the chicken a fluttering appearance, at the same time calling to the hawk, she will come directly in and pull it down. In this case, keep the dog from molesting her in her descent, and give her leave to plume and divert herself on the fowl. While she is thus engaged, bring the dogs close about her and let her eat the head and neck among them as her reward. By following this method, you will bring your hawk to be so bold that she no sooner shall see a pheasant go to perch than she will seize him and bring him down. Beware of strange dogs, because they will mar your hawk. One strange and unruly dog will mislead the other dogs, and the hawk will know him, and give way for fear of him. And when they chase in with the hawk and fowl, the strange dog may not only attack, but even tear the hawk and fowl to pieces, and learn the rest to join him. When a fowl is surprised on the ground, and seized by a spaniel, you are not to call down your hawk to it, but throw it up to her, using your voice to excite her attention. If she miss it, anyhow, at the first throw, you are to repeat it until she trusts the fowl and come down with it, and give her the usual reward among the dogs. It were well you accustomed her now, and then to this exercise with a poet, when you have no pheasants. This will learn her to bear the preference and noise of men, horse, and dogs, without being intimidated, for the goshawk is naturally shy and wild. End of chapter 34 Chapter 35 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the haggard goshawk This hawk is of all others the wildest, and consequently the most difficult to be reclaimed. Hence the greatest care and diligence become necessary to render her manageable. The same treatment you were directed to give to the hawk from the cage, you are to give her, but with the addition of much more time, patience, and gentleness. She requires all the skill of the most experienced falconer, as in her wild state she is exposed to the rapacity of many enemies. Nature and necessity force her to take cover with her prey, where she may securely feed on it and this custom she retains to the great trouble of the falconer, even after she is reclaimed in a good measure. The way to cure her of this vexatious fault is never to feed her in the woods or thicket, but to make her attend you to an open field where there is not any cover to hide her. Call her then to your fist, and feed her with a bit or two on it, after which put to her leash, and let her eat the rest of her meal on the ground by you, reserving only a stump to lure her to your fist again. Afterwards, set her on the ground, and stooping, convey some bits slyly to her, so that she may hardly perceive your hand, which you would cause her strike with her talons at the meat. By carrying this method, you will gradually wear off her wildness, and take away her inclination to carry and gorge in secret. This accomplished, you may carry her freely to the field, and enter her at partridge according to the rules already delivered. Only observe, further, that you have her meal ready along with you, 
and feed her slowly with it. While she is pluming the first fowl she kills, till she have enough. And this also will be a mean to hinder her from carrying to the field herself. She will wait for you, and expect to reward at your hand alone, leaving the fowl to your own disposal. The goshawk is seldom found fit for both the open country and cover. Therefore, if you have one that delights in partridge, keep her for this kind of sport only, and never let her fly at pheasant. For the ease of killing the latter, which is a slow flyer, will make her abandon the former, as it is a swift flyer. End of chapter 35 Chapter 36 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of flying the goshawk at wild duck, mallard, heron, goose, and rooks. Ducks and mallards delight in ponds and marshes that are surrounded with shrubs and rushes and grass, where they meet with little molestation. To train your hawk to this sport, provide three or four tame ducks of the same color with the wild one, and throw her up one of them for as many days. When she has brought them down, Suffer her to plume them at her leisure, and give her the heads and necks for her reward. Then get one or two more, which on trial you know to be good flyers, and send one of them with a servant before you. Two upon surrounded with bushes, where she is to lie hid till your arrival. When you come to the same place, strike the bushes with your pole, which is to be a signal to your servant to let off the tame duck into the air without discovering himself. The hawk, being sharp set, will take the air directly after her and bring her down in an instant. When you have given her a few lessons of this kind, you may boldly enter her at wild game, with assurance of much success. Creep as near as you can to the pond or marsh, holding up your hawk as high as you can, and beating the bushes or edges to raise the fowls. As soon as she brings one of them down, Run in and cross its wings, that it may not hurt your hawk. Let her plume it and amuse herself with it, and then reward her as usual. It will be proper for you to have a swimming spaniel along with you, for when the hawk is well acquainted with the sport, she will be so ready to rake the fowl as it rises, that they shall both fall into the water together. In this case, the dog either catches and brings out the duck, or sets it to its wings, and gives the hawk another opportunity for seizing it and receiving her reward. As to the heron, goose, and rook, you are to teach your hawk to take the first two in the same way you enter her at the last. Get some live rooks, and pull out some of the wing feathers of one of them on each side, and set it on the ground. Then unhood your hawk at the distance of about forty paces, and turn her head towards the place where the rook is walking. She will likely fly at it. In this case, let her plume and be well rewarded on it. Next, put your rook in a long creance, without any feathers drawn, and peg it into the ground, about a yard or two from the end of which the rook is tied. Keep the other end in your own hand, and unhooding your hawk, let her fly at the rook. But before she reaches the rook, pull the creance, by which means you will draw up the peg, and give the rook leave to fly a little way before the hawk reach her. In this manner you will teach her to seize rooks on wing even after. The tersal answers best for small birds, but the goshawk is to be flown at goose or heron because she is much stronger. These last mentioned birds come into the power of the goshawk in the same way as the rook, but you must always cross the wings as soon as you can, after they are brought down, least by their beating they hurt your hawk. To conclude, you may also fly the goshawk at hares and rabbits, to which you will enter her, by putting them in a long creance. She kills them at the bow as easily as wild ducks. End of chapter 36 Chapter 37 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 37 Of the Sparhawk The Sparhawk is short-winged, the diminutive of the goshawk, and kills at the bow. She flies at the crow, the rook, the lapwing, the pigeon, the magpie, the sparrow which she will pursue through the thickest hedges, in particular at partridges and harvest. From the 1st of September to November, when the frost sets in, at which time partridges are too strong for them, she is to be bred from the eyrie or nest, which is found on a tree in our woods, 
and is to be trained as the goshawk. They are not so easily tamed as merlins, being naturally much wilder. Take care to have her always in company with men, dogs, or horses to keep as well as to make her manny. But by proper diligence, you may tame even the haggard in ten days, so as she come to your fist from a tree. But if she wander a day from you, she will have forgotten you. There is no hawk which will kill as many partridges in a day as she will, and she flies just as well in the cover as in plain and open ground. As she is very shy, she must be prepared for the field the night before you take it, with washing meat, plumage, and casting to give her stomach the keen edge, and as she is small bird, she must be kept high with nice meat and firm, clean flesh to enable her to endure fatigue and to go through her duty with spirit. To make her fly the better, you must have along with you in a little box some fresh butter mixed up with a little saffron and sugar candy, which you are to give her either with her meat or alone. It will keep her head clear, her temper good, her spirit high, and her body from the cray. The musket is a very small bird, but makes excellent sport at small birds through hedges. End of chapter 37 Chapter 38 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the laner and lanerette The laner is a hawk very common in most countries, especially in France, making her iry on lofty trees and forests, or on high cliffs near the sea. The ayas from the iry is of all hawks the most easily tamed to your purpose. She is trained like the falcon gentle. You first teach her to come to the lure garnished with meat. Then let her kill two or three fowls at it, but which have some space to flutter about. When you have rendered her expert in killing in this way, let her be lured to the field from man to man with a fowl in a creance from which she cannot carry it off. If she sees it briskly, let her be well rewarded on it. But after that, let her have no more upward-flown fowls from the hand. The reason is this, they become so fixedly attached to any habits they get that it is impossible to wean them from them afterwards. And, were they accustomed to fowls from the hand, they never would chase them wild in the air. This arises from her phlegmatic temper, which cannot endure the trouble of changing. Accordingly, of all hawks, the haggard lanner is the wildest and most difficult to be reclaimed. She is to be made manny much in the same way as you treat the falcon gentle, but with infinitely more trouble. The ramage laner is of the same disposition and requires the same treatment. They are both very subject to the fault of carrying, and cured of it with great difficulty. The method is to lure her only once at a time, and to feed her the moment after you take her from the lure with small bits from your hand, the spaniel being by you all the while. At her first entering, you are to have but few dogs with you, and these must be gentle and cool, that she may more easily get acquainted with them. For if they take fright and hatred at dogs, it is impossible to reconcile her to them, and will ever after carry the instant they come in her sight, and prey on the game she seizes. Too hard flying and too low feeding will much enter any hawk, but they prove destructive to the laner and it is by these extremes that she is generally spoiled. Therefore, great care is to be taken to call her from her wings before she grows faint, and to keep up her flesh with diet suited to her appetite and digestion. Let her kill fowls in a long creance, hard by you, to accustom her to your presence, and to help her wildness away, and reward her with the fowls she kills, or with other such meat. Washed a little, as you do the falcon. Then you may put her to the river in company with a good make hawk, and by the force of example, she will become a good river hawk herself. End of chapter 38. Chapter 39 of A Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the Thaker. This hawk is to be bred like the falcon gentle, but she is much more difficult in training. Her eyrie has not yet found anywhere but in the Levantine Islands. She is a little longer than the haggard falcon, her plumes rusty and ragged, 
Her foot and beak resemble those of the lanner. Her pounce is short, and her train the longest among all birds of prey. She is very strong and hardy, and will attack all fowls, particularly large ones as goose, etc. She flies also with pheasant and partridge, and is much less dainty in her diet than long-winged hawks are. She makes excellent sport with the kite, which, as soon as the shaker is thrown off, takes to her wings, going directly to her highest pitch, and making many turns in the air. The many contests bewixed them afford great pleasure to the spectators. End of chapter 39《40 of a Treaty of Modern Falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Of the diseases of hawks and their cure. Hawks are subject to various diseases which are occasioned by various causes, and these guarded against, their bad effects are prevented. Hawks suffer by cold, especially from water, when they are hot in their grease, by being too hastily enseamed, by exclusion from the fresh air, by unwholesome food, by being suddenly raised in their flesh, by being brought suddenly low, and by everything else which is contrary to their nature. You may discern your hawk is sick by her croaking and the slackness of her feathers and the startings of her feet or legs. But to be more particular, one, of a hawk which retains her stones too long, when your hawk retains her stones beyond the natural period for casting them, you are to keep her strong and full of flesh, and give her the smaller kind of stones out of fair water at night. This disorder arises from weakness, and must therefore be cured, not by provocatives to cast, but by time and skillful management. 2. Of scourings for hawks which digest ill. Scourings are necessary to hawks when they are foul and unable to digest their food. The morning is the proper season for giving them this remedy, which ought to be carefully suited to the state of their constitution. To prepare strong hawks for a purge, they must be labored eight days before with carriage, clean food and casting to stir them, and loosen the filth in their panel. This done, feed them in the morning that they may be empty by eight at night when you are to give them neither bones nor feathers, then you may give them the scouring, and set them up warm at night, that they may not take cold through emptiness. The following is the receipt for a comforting water, to be given them after the scouring. Take half a dozen bruised cloves, as many thin slices of licorice, and a little brown sugar candy. Put all these ingredients into a pint of fair water, and let them steep together at night. Give your hawks a teaspoon or two of it each early in the morning with stones, and when they have cast them, they will be in order for a moderate breakfast of good meat. This water, together with stones, will purge away the remains of the scouring you gave them overnight, and it is besides an excellent restorative by itself to poor and weak hawks. 3. Of curing hawks overtired on being first entered. When your hawk is over fatigued by severe flights, immediately after being entered, give her the following physic. Take a bottle of claret and boil it down on a slow fire to an English pint with four ounces of sugar candy, two drops of saffron, one drop of cinnamon, one drop of mace, and a pepper clove. Let this composition cool, cork it well up in a small bottle, and give your hawk a teaspoon of it to recover her strength and courage. For a general cure, the following medicine is very general, being effectual both in preventing and curing many disorders. Take two drops of saffron, two drops of cinnamon, two drops of mace, six pepper cloves, a little scrape of rhubarb, a little carduris benedictus, the bulk of an egg of wormwood, and as much of rue which two last ingredients must be dried at the fire. Pound all these in a mortar together, and afterwards stir them into a quarter pound of butter, perfectly fresh, which has to be melted over the fire, and then add to the whole a little rose water, 
Lay up this composition for use in an earthen pot covered with leather, where it will continue good for a year. The same quantity of a bean wrought into the same quantity of powdered sugar candy is a dose for a falcon, and the half of that is a dose for a tercel. 5. To cure hawks suddenly wasted. If you perceive your hawk fall suddenly from her health to plight into weakness and inward decay, you cannot give her a more gentle and more restorative physic than that prescribed in number 3. But previous to your administering it, you are to feed her at night with the best meat and give her the proper dose in the morning. During the operation, until she craves food, you are to set her on a warm brick covered with double woolen cloth to keep her comfortable. When her appetite is come, you are to give her a little and often of the best hot meat, and never without some of the water along with it, mentioned in number two. Thus, with warmth and nourishment, she will recover her health gradually and take to her usual diet. But, six, to cure strong, foul hawks. If your hawk is strong but unclean within, give her the following medicine. Put a quarter of a pound of fresh butter into a saucer full of white wine vinegar. Boil them over a gentle fire, skimming away the gross parts they throw up. They, being well clarified, put into them four bruised cloves, one branch of rue, one branch of wormwood, two flakes of saffron, and a tolerable piece of sugar candy. Boil all these together a good while, then taking out the rue, and the wormwood, and the cloves, and the saffron, and draining out what remains of the vinegar, make the rest into pills rolled in brown sugar candy. Two of these pills, about the size of acorns, are the dose for a hog. But if this medicine does not work well enough, you may give her a little aloes wrapped up in one of the pills to increase its strength. This scouring is good for hawks surfeited by bad food, as it is both cleanses and comforts the bowels. 7. To cure lured hawks heated in their grease before they are thoroughly inseamed. If your hawk be lured, but heated in her grease before she be thoroughly inseamed, give her the following scouring. Take equal quantities of rosemary and box leaves powdered with a little whorehound. Mingle them all in clarified fresh butter and make them up in pills with brown candy sugar. The dose is a pill or two which will purge the panel and make your hawk inseam easily. 8. To cure an overheated liver and overflowing gall. If you have reason to suspect your hawk's liver overheated or her gall overflowing, you must feed her with light cooling food dipped into the distilled water of endive succory wherein a slice of rhubarb has been infused. At the end of four days, give her a gentle scouring to take away the binding quality of the rhubarb. 9. To cure an overheated heart. If your hawk is overheated about the heart, you will perceive her disease by the dryness and ropiness of her casting and mutes by the dullness of the color of her feathers and pounces. By her eagerness for bowsing, in bathing. In this case, light and cooling food must be observed, and for a medicine, infuse half a dozen sliced cloves into the distilled water of borage and bugloss, and dip your hawk's meat into it. Give her also rest that fatigue may not increase her disease. 10. To cure the philanders. If your hawk is distressed by philanders or other worms, and by hearing her peep in the night, when pinched by them, Give her a clove of garlic pierced through all over, which has been well steeped in the juice of wormwood or an oil. Let her have this every night with her supper for two or three days together, and offer water to her every morning. Then, leaving off the garlic, give her at supper two or three bits of meat rolled in mustard seed till she appear to have recovered her health. 11. To Cure Indigestion if your hawk is troubled with indigestion and unable to put her food over into her panel, you must endeavor to make her throw it up to prevent its putrefying on her gorge and killing her. In this case, water, if she take it, and a few stones, has sometimes been known to do much good, but with the evil is obstinate. Use the following medicine to scour her gently. Take butter preserved in rose water, 
a little of the powders of saffron and myrrh, and the powder of a half dozen cloves of mace. Mingle them all together with a little brown sugar candy, and make the composition up into pills. Before you give your hawk any meat on her indigestion, give her one or two of these pills early in the morning. When you perceive her emptied by their operation, give her, at the useful hour of feeding, but a single bit of the very best meat, and the same quantity at other times, just as she is easily able to digest. Next morning give her stones with a pill of wormwood, and after casting them, feed her with clean sweet meat dipped in the water set down in number two. Avoid forcing your hawk to throw up, lest the straining kill her, except the hawk be strong enough to bear the size of a bean of alum, which will certainly bring all away. After the alum, you shall give her some of the above-mentioned water to comfort her bowels. 12. To cure heat of the stomach. If your hawk is subject to drought and heat in the stomach, or in any other of her inward parts, you will relieve her by the following medicine. Take almost two ounces of French barley, well washed, and boil it for a minute in fair water in a pipkin. Throw away the water, and put it to the same quantity of new water, letting that boil just as long. Change water too, and put to the barley a quart of fair water, and boil it into a pint. Strain this pint through a linen cloth from the barley, and mix it up with as much sugar candy as will sweeten it, letting them boil together for a minute. When it is cold, give some of it to your hawk, as often as you feed her for four days, for it will keep good no longer, and you are to make it anew as long as you need it. 13. To cure the croak. If your hawk be seized with the croak, a very dangerous and deadly disease, use the following medicine. Into half a pint of claret, put a little sugar candy, three or four slices of the whitest ginger, and as many bruised cloves. Pour these into a silver or pewter plate, cover close with another, which answers it so exactly as to let none of the steam escape, and boil them over a slow fire in a chafing dish, keeping the heat equal by a pair of bellows. Take off the cover now and then, and wipe off the moisture you will find on it with a feather into a dish, where you may keep it till you put it in a vial when it is all collected. Give your hawk a little of it with her food, and at the same time, rest and warmth. And if she be newly taken ill, it will certainly cure her. If the cramp is joined with the croak, give her the scouring mentioned in number four. But if the hawk be low, you must give her a very gentle dose. The above liquid also helps digestion and weakness. But if the hawk has been long disordered with the croak and has given over eating, the following management is seldom ineffectual. Instead of warmth and drugs and indolence, you must set your hawk to her wings night and day, about the house and in plantations, where she may sit dry when she wants to rest. She will follow you when you go to the field, croaking hard and craving food, but the first day she will only tear and throw away her food, without swallowing it a bit. The next day, however, she will be enabled by her exercise to take a little, perhaps half a sparrow and come thus to her stomach by degrees. When she is able to eat anything, you must put a pepper clove into a bit of her food, which is to be always of small birds while she is so very weak. The terrible distemper arises from foul feeding, hunger stress from her being lost a few days, beating from the fist, hanging by the jesses, and from cold after heat. 14. To cure the cramp. If your hawk be seized with a cramp, a disease produced by cold without exercise, or by foul feeding, and if she be clean and perfectly inseamed, mind the following management. Boil a large brass pot of water, two or three handfuls of red and white sage, and as much polypody of the oak. Cover the pot after you have taken it off the fire, with woolen cloth very thick, that the warm steam may rise very gently through it, neither too hot nor too cold. On this covering lay your hawk, and renew the heat of the water as you see occasion, when it cools. And also give her a clove of garlic every morning, for two or three days successively, to expel the inward cold. But if you suspect grease within her, 
purge it away with a little leaf of rue and wormwood shred finely down and mingled with fresh butter and sugar candy give one or two pills of this composition to your hawk two or three mornings in the week and it will in due time restore her health 15 to cure the frowns if your hawk is seized with the frowns you will know it by the mouth and throat being continually frothy furred and white this disease is occasioned by water which falls from the head on the throat and tongue and affects both as a cancer the way to prevent this disorder is to give your hawk when she is stuffed in the head with cold the rump of a cow or sheep fixed on the block to tear at it and the violent pulling will make the water to fly out of her nares and so hinder it from producing the frowns the way to cure it is as follows take a saucer full of the very best white wine vinegar boil in it for four minutes three or four leaves of red sage add a pretty good quantity of the powder of burnt alum and then let it boil f about a minute put up the liquor for use in a glass vial well stopped when cold but if the hog be dangerously infected steep for a day in the liquor the size of two small nuts of brimstone finely powdered and tied up in a linen rag and with this addition the medicine will cure the most inveterate frowns while you administer this cure your hawk must be clean within and be indulged in rest and good and nourishment you are to lay on this liquor a little warm with a feather anointing the scabs after the first dressing take off the scabs to the quick and immediately anoint the sores with the feather dipped in the liquor let this dressing continue to the third day when you are to take off such scabs as are ready for themselves to come away and let the rest remain till they loosen and come easily off that by frequent dressing you may not ruin your hawk's mouth but if the disease be just beginning you may stop its progress by blowing burnt alum through a quill into the hawk's mouth and throat which will cure her 16 to cure the cramp in the feet and legs if your hawk is seized in the legs and feet only with the cramp the following cure has been recommended put the powder of peony root by your hawk all day in a little bag of linen that she may smell it all night hang it about her neck in a string or take a bit of bryony root and fasten it about your hawk's leg and lay it also near her beak that she may taste it 17 to cure the pin the pin is a disease which rises in the feet of hawks from the restlessness in the mew whereby they are battered into callousness resembling corns in human feet the pin can be cured only by careful excision and the wound is to be cured with plaster of galbanin white pitch and venice turpentine spread on fine leather and nicely fastened repeat the dressing thrice a week till the wound is healed 18 to cure a bruise if your hawk's legs or feet swell from a bruise anoint and rub the place with refined bacon grease beaten well up with aqua vitae and wrap it about with a linen rag soaked in the bacon grease melted and about that wrap another cloth or bit of leather to defend it from the air 19 to cure the cray the cray is a disease of hawks which makes them mute scantily and with difficulty and arises from cold occasioned by gross and cold washed meat to cure this distemper you are to feed your hawk with chickens young pigeons and other food of light and easy digestion in the meantime clarify some very fresh butter with ten bruised cloves of mace boiled in it and as it cools add a little of the powder of rue put this composition in a box and anoint your hawk's food with it giving her greasy gorges this will soon open her head and enable her to slice cleverly but if you would have her head perfectly well purged and her inward passages throughout cooled, use the juice of daisies or sage to cause her to throw out the remaining noxious humors this done add to the juice a little of the flour of brimstone gradually to dry them up and give her also with her meat the water of barley as prepared in number twelve twenty to cure the itching of a hawk Hawks are sometimes seized with an itching in the body part of the feather where it is inserted into their bodies, and to ease themselves, they bite and tug at it with their beaks till they pull it out. To cure this itch, take a pint of the best vinegar, two races of ginger grated to dust, 
and boil them together a good while with three branches of rue. Then add the size of a walnut of alum, and half a spoonful of honey, and let them boil a little longer. A little of this preparation, laid warm with a feather, on the diseased feathers, will effectually cure them. 21. Of a bad weathered hawk. If your hawk is bad weathered, that is, will not sit on your fist when the wind blows, but hails and beats and hangs by the jesses, she is an ill habit of the worst kind. The way to cure her is to turn her out in a stormy night among trees, where she can have no shelter but be obliged to hold by the branches. If this expedient do not amend her, she is incurable and no longer worth your attention. End of chapter 40 A glossary of the technical terms of falconry Of a treaty of modern falconry by James Campbell. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Glossary The falconer's word is hold fast. A. Arms The legs of a hawk from the thigh to the foot. B. Bathing The action of a hawk where she refreshes herself in water. Beak, the crooked part of her bill. Beams, the long feathers of her wings. Baiting, the fluttering of her wings when she strives to fly away from perch or fist. Bowsing, her drinking frequently. C. Cage, a machine of square figure, form of four narrow boards, on which falconers transport their hawks from place to place when they have many. Casting, the feathers given a hawk to cleanse her gorge. Casting a hawk, the holding her in your hands by the shoulders with her wings close, that she may not bait when you force anything on her. Cocking, the treading of hawks. Ceasing, the fast hold of a hawk takes with her foot. Cecil, the first long feathers of a hawk's wings. Check, the flying away of a hawk from her natural game after rooks or pigeons. Cowering, the shaking of a young hawk's wings in obedience to an old one. Crabbing, the fighting of hawks as they sit by one another. Cuddle, the third long feather of a hawk's wings. D, disclosed, newly hatched. Dropping, the muting of a hawk directly downwards. E, in due, is thorough digestion. Iry, the hawk's nest or the place where she builds it. F. Feeking. The wiping which a hawk gives her beak after she is fed. Flag feathers. The shortest feathers of a hawk's wings next to her shoulders. Flying on head. This the hawk is said to do when, missing the fowl she set out after, she takes the next check. G. Gleaming. The throwing up of filth after casting. Glute. The slimy substance in the panel. Gorge. The crop or craw. Gurgiting, suffocating, by whatever cause, or kind of meat. I. Ink, the neck of a bird from the head to the body. Intermute, the change of a hawk's color from red to white the second year. Juke, to sleep. L. Lice, a sort of vermin which live on hawks. Long open, the second of the long feathers of a hawk's wings. M. Make hawk, an old staunch hawk used to instruct young ones in flying. Male feathers, those of the breast. Managing, the making of a hawk, manny or tame. Mantling, the lowering of a hawk's wings down to her feet. Mew, the place where a hawk changes her feathers. Mites, a vermin smaller than lice, found about the head and nares. Mute, the excrement of hawks. N. Nares, the nostrils. P. Panel, the part next to the fundament where digestion is completed. Pelt, the dismembered carcass of any fowl. Pendant feathers, those behind the thigh. Petty fingers, the toes of a hawk. Pill of a fowl, what remains after the hawk is fed. Plumage. Small downy feathers given hawks for casting. Plume. The color of a hawk's feathers whereby her age or constitution is known. Pluming. This the hawk is said to do when she pulls the feathers off her prey. Prey. 
what a hawk kills and feeds on herself. Q. Quarry, the fowl which hawks are flown at. R. Raised in flesh, a hawk in this condition is fat and prospers. Rake out. A hawk does so when she flies too far out from the game. Ramage, wild, unmanageable. Reclaiming, taming. Rousing, the action of a hawk when she shakes herself. Resting, when the hawk strikes but does not truss her prey. S. Sails, the wings of a hawk. Sealing, the blinding of a haggard with a thread passed through her eyelids to hold them together in order to tame her. Setting down, the putting of a hawk into the mew. Slicing, the mew of a hawk to a good distance from her. Sliming, her muting directly down without dropping. Sniting, sneezing. Sore hawk, so called from the time she is taken from the eyrie till she has mewed her feathers. Stooping, the quick and impetuous descent of a hawk to strike her prey. Summed, a hawk is so when she has all her feathers and is ready to be taken from the mew. T. Tearing the action of a hawk pulling at the pinion of a wing. Train the tail. Trusting. A hawk does this when she raises a fowl into the air and comes down with it again. U. Unsummed. A hawk is so when she has not yet received all her feathers. W. Warbling. The crossing of the wings over the back. Weathering, the setting out of a hawk to take the air. End of glossary. End of a treaty of modern falconry by James Campbell.